January 12th, 2023. Uh, welcome everyone. And as an introduction to our board meeting, Mrs. Geyer, Carmen will lead us off. My name is Carmen Geyer, and I would like to welcome you to the January 12th Port Angeles School District Board of Directors Board Meeting. Items to be mentioned before we begin, that this meeting is open to the public and is recorded. You can listen to all past board meetings by visiting board docs on our district website. If you have any questions or comments that you would like shared with the board of directors, please email Jenny Wilson, the executive assistant to the superintendent by emailing jwilson at portangelaschools.org. There will be a portion of the meeting reserved for community comments. Agenda items will be addressed as listed in the agenda. For those attending in person who wish to make community comments, please sign up using the sheet in the hallway. When it's your turn to speak, your name will be called. Before making comments, please state your name and address, and each person will have three minutes to speak. Accusations, foul language, and other verbal abuse will not be tolerated. If you do so, you'll be asked to refrain from using such language. If you continue to use inappropriate language, you'll be asked to stop. If you have any questions or concerns about individual district employees or specific complaints that require an administrative response, please contact the Office of the Superintendent directly. Thank you and back to you, Madam President. Thank you, Carmen. So our roll call, everybody is here tonight in person. Uh, we begin all of our uh, school board meetings with the flag salute, so if you'll join me. Thank you. Now I will ask Dr. Long to read the acknowledgement of public land. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. We acknowledge that we are on the indigenous lands of Coast Salish peoples who have reserved territory rights to this land, specifically the Clallam tribes. We thank these caretakers of this land who have lived and continue to live here since time immemorial. Thank you. So now I ask, how does the agenda look? It's all right. And that takes us to the consent agenda. The purpose of the consent agenda is to recognize routine matters. So I ask for a motion on the consent. I move. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. So that takes us to distribution of correspondence. No. None. All right. We're just cooking along. Principal Vandaway, you are up. Yay, I brought two best friends because they're both with me. And now, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Very well. Yeah, like it was hard before. No need to lean in or look at it. Well, I was told that if I put it right here, it might be a little much. Yeah, you're doing I, just fine. <laughs> it wasn't wrong. Uh, so, one of the things that I love about this year is that um, this is my seventh year at Roosevelt. So, what that means is that these two fine people that are standing here with me have been with me since the beginning. And I love it so much to watch them grow and all the things. So, today we get to honor two incredible students. So, we're going to start off with Miss Emma. Emma Jardins, and so I'll just read um, what was shared from her teacher, and um, then I'm going to add my own. Emma is an amazing student, but that is only scratching the surface of her many talents. She shows enthusiasm and initiative for classroom activities while exhibiting a positive attitude. She is always striving to reach her full potential and takes responsibility for her learning. She consistently shows respect for teachers and peers while setting an example of excellence in behavior and cooperation. It is a privilege and an honor to have a student of her caliber in class who is so kind and helpful. So that was from Mrs. Sanders, and I could not say more amazing things about Emma. If there's ever anything that needs to be done, Emma's always jumping right in. She leads by example with her peers. She also um, is a beautiful support for all younger students. So she takes a, a big leadership role in working with um, our little ones. She does have two younger sisters, so we're fortunate that we get three amazing girls, and she definitely has a uh, 
been setting a really, really fine example for her sisters and every member of our Roosevelt community. So very, very well deserved. And then let's brag on Killian. So Killian Lang shows respect with his kind and caring attitude toward classmates and adults. He considers others' feelings and looks for ways to help. Killian frequently coaches others in math, listens politely to ideas, and never puts others down. In addition, Killian practices responsible learner behaviors every day in class. He is prepared with all needed materials, including his finished homework, stays on task during cooperative learning activities, and completes work neatly and to the best of his ability. Way to go. Killian. And I'm going to brag on Killian too. So Killian also comes from a large family and so it's, um, it's epic because you can see the way that Killian shows leadership not only in his family but once again Killian is, it, but, well both of these guys, but Killian in particular, um, a very quiet confidence. Killian is always doing the right thing and without saying much or being boastful in any way, others follow his lead. And so um, just, I just love these two so much, and I'm so glad that we got to celebrate them here tonight. Good job, Kim. Yeah. Oh, boy, here we go. Don't trip on the cords. I will attempt to not make an idiot of myself. <laughs> I survived. All right, so the school district has certificates of recognition for both of you. Thank you for being such great representatives of this district. They say, uh, the Port Angeles School District is honored to acknowledge your positive contributions in and out of the classroom at Roosevelt Elementary. Congratulations on being the Port Angeles School District Student of the Month. And it was signed by all. So, that is for both of you. And now we would love to have all of the families to come up. We're going to take a picture with the board and your Students of the Month and families for our document. All right. Sorry, I didn't warn you. I don't have to be in the photo. <laughs> you have to be in the photo. I'm, I'm oh, going to be in the photo. I feel like teacher show. And staff. Oh, no, no. Staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come yeah. yeah. on. Okay. We'll let me try to Come on. Keep on moving. All right. I, I, I'm going to. Open the board in the back for the students. And the families up front. And the families up front. Okay. I mean, it's a big night. How to make sure. Here you be. All the things. I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? I mean, we can hear each other. Perfect. Yeah. Weird. We must have voices to project. Okay. No way. <laughs> 
All right. The Roosevelt presentation. The Roosevelt presentation. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. We're just waiting for. You got it? It's not changing. We thought it might be the speaker, like the speaker behind me. This doesn't count off my time. There it is. There it is. Uh, hi, everybody. We'll uh, get started with um, the. Oh, there we go. Going by my friends. Um, all right. So I am here to talk about uh, my favorite thing to talk about, which is Roosevelt Elementary and all the people and all the things that make it such a great place to be every day. Um, and so every year we like to have a little bit of a theme. So we've kind of sprinkled the theme into the visuals for today. And so this year our theme is where the mountains meet the sea. And we chose that specifically because this year we get to get back out into our community and we wanted to be connected to our community in a multitude of different ways. And so that is why we chose to, um, to really highlight where we live and who we are and how that shapes who we're going to become in the future. And so we got to start the year this year um, with our meet and greet. We have consistently had a meet and greet at Roosevelt's um, in all the time that I've been there and for many years prior. And it's just a really, really great way to start the school year. We have everybody invited to come the day before school starts, see their classroom, drop off their things, see where their desk is going to be and it um, is just a really um, great way to have them start the first day of school ready. They've got all their materials, they know where they're going to go, they know who their teacher is and so then that way our very first day of school we hit the ground running and we really get right to business. So it's um, and it's fun because we have popsicles. So there's that. Next. Um, we have, with the Mountains Meet the Sea, we're really dedicated this year to getting into the community. Um, all of our grade levels are finding ways to have field trips that um, show where we're from and how we're connected to the local area. And so we've got, uh, we're so thankful that we got to go back to Nature Bridge this year. We were also fortunate that because um, of the way that the calendaring worked, we got to go in September, and it was one of those beautiful weeks in September where it was in the 70s. That never happens. Uh, Kelly has been uh, soaked to the skin more often than I think any human should be out at Nature Bridge, but this time the weather gods were shining on her. So that's our, our sixth graders who hadn't, um, almost half of them hadn't uh, ever been out even to that end of the, the park before. So it was pretty fun to have them out at the park and get that started. That was kind of our first foray into the community. Next. So there's another one of Nature Bridges, the large one. And then our second graders got to go up to Hurricane Ridge. See, these are things that we used to take for granted, like it was just what we do. And this year it just meant so much because um, we haven't gotten out and gotten to, to see what it is that surrounds us and how we are a part of that. Our TKs and our kindergartners also had the opportunity to go to Agnew Grocery in October and pick out a pumpkin and do some activities there. So, um, so that was about a half day little event where they got uh, a taste of what it's going to be like to be a Roosevelt Cougar and do these things out in our community. Next. There's our little kinder friends all in a group uh, thinking that that's just the most fun day ever, which it was. Next, and there's some of our second graders up at the top of um, Hurricane Ridge, and um, and now our fourth graders are in planning mode to go up as well, which I think is the next one. Ha! Upcoming adventures. So. 
Uh, fourth grade, as most of you know, is the year that you get the National Park Pass. And so with the, the National Park, um, Hurricane Ridge Road had to close for a little bit there, but now they're working together with um, some of the local park officials to get our fourth graders up uh, to the ridge and then do some other various assorted things. Our fifth graders are, um, they're actually in two weeks, they're gonna go to the library. It's so weird, these things that we've just said were, were just what we do. Um, two thirds of our fifth graders don't have a library card at the, right? At just the library down the road. But you know, that where we are, um, just our physical location and the children that we serve, it's just very interesting how, how isolated it can be. Um, but just to be, you know, three miles out of downtown, um, they just oftentimes don't get out and, and connect with our community resources. So we're really finding ways to make sure that they know what they have available and opening those doors for them. Um, our kindergartners have a, uh, we're recipients of the grant again this year to go to Point Defiance Zoo in um, the spring and that's always just a super fun trip mm -hmm. and then um, Erica Cook who is a third grade teacher with us she has always spearheaded taking the kids to the Seattle Children's Theater in third grade and so um, and then in the spring they go and they see a play and they get to Seattle and as um, you've probably heard before so many of our kids have never been to Seattle which is just fascinating to me and so it's just very eye opening for them to have that experience. So Erica was talking to some of the rest of our team and we, um, we <coughs> reflected on the fact that um, our fourth and fifth graders didn't have that opportunity either because because and so this year we're going to take all three grades and um, Karen has worked with us to make sure that we have busing available we're not going to do it on the same day <laughs> I know I, we wanted to take them on the same day but um, but that's a lot of children to Seattle the one watch I, I, right? Um, so we're going to take them in three groups um, by grade level in three consecutive weeks in April. So it's going to be awesome. I can't wait. So there's that. So that's all about how we're out in the community. I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we've got going on in our building. Um, it is busy, busy, busy at Roosevelt every day. Um, we are um, really hitting our stride. Everybody loves January and February because it feels like the routine is really getting into place. And um, uh, this year more than ever, you know, we haven't had kind of that that settled in feeling for a lot of years and like like we came back from from New Year's this year going okay this is it we're, we're in the zone so it feels really good and and um, everybody's working hard if you have the opportunity to come to the building and you're ever out and about I mean it's it's jamming in every corner people are on task doing the work and smiling the whole time so it's a great place to be and um, the kids are learning a lot um, this is a, an example of some of the out-of-the-box thinking that we're doing. Um, in the, the week before Thanksgiving, um, we did a novel engineering project. And so if you know what novel engineering is, it's like if you are reading a, a book, and in the book there is either a, a problem to be solved or a um, critical moment in a story, and then you have to think, how would you solve that problem differently than maybe the main characters did? And then you build something to show how you would solve that problem. Well, we took that and kind of put a little twist on it, and uh, because it's Thanksgiving week, and in New York there's the Macy's Day Parade with the big balloons, so we made these little small balloons that mm -hmm. were somehow creating pieces out of the stories of kids' favorite books. So every, we did, our second graders and our fourth graders, they did uh, Balloons Over Roosevelt Parade, where they created their favorite storybook characters in a, a critical juncture in the story, and then they um, they did a lap around the, because you, you've been there, you could do an interior lap, and everybody came out and cheered them on, and it was really fun, and, um, and then it was fun to guess who the character was and why they chose them, so. That was a fun way to connect literature and science and our school community. All right, diving into some data stuff because that's entertaining. But um, we are really, really focused on, on, um, on MTSS. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we are addressing um, 
multi-tiered systems of support. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, don't worry. You'll know more than you ever wanted to know by the time I'm done. So um, with multi-tiered systems of support, it means that in um, the areas of social emotional learning and behavior, as well as reading and math, we want to make sure that we're meeting every child's needs. And the way that we do that is through great core instruction. That means what every child is getting is really uh, targeted to their needs to meet the standards at their grade level. So that's what we call tier one instruction. Every child gets good instruction in all three of those areas at tier one. And that's kind of our baseline. And for 80% or around 80% of our kids, that typically meets the target. They, those kids get what they need by having good tier one instruction. And then we know that with good tier one instruction, there's probably still going to be kids that need additional help. And so we can say that within, um, that about 20% of students might need something else. So we call tier two instruction the differentiated pieces that we do to provide additional support for students that didn't necessarily meet standard with just core. So for all students, they have access to core, which is tier one, and then for some students, they need something else, which is differentiated tier two. Then we know that within that tier two that we've got oh, three to five percent of kids that need something totally different and individualized. And so we are looking at intensive individual supports in a tier two format. So for, for example, some of those tier Tier, sorry, tier three student uh, supports would look like special education supports. Um, they might look like 504 supports. They might look like um, like additional behavior plans. So we're um, well. High cap meets well, but what high cap their standard um, supports are met through tier one because they can access grade level standard content through core. They get grade level content achieved through core. Now, what this little tier system doesn't address necessarily is how we give these supports because one of the things that we do when we're giving these supports is when we have a tier two need, so we know we have students that do not yet meet standard in an area, we um, pull together we, we do a lot of different creative things, but we pull together kind of um, a differentiated time where students that need the additional supports to meet grade level needs are getting that. Students that need extra practice just at grade level standard in order to maintain that are getting that. And then we have some extension opportunities that are offered at the same time. So we tend to call that win time what I need and so um, every grade level is pulling out win time sometime during the day where teachers can be pulling small groups and some of our grade levels are working in conjunction across like all three classes or four classes that are at that grade level and they're doing some some walk to activities so for example and I'll get into this too, but but you, you hit on it, so here we are. I know. So um, we just did mid-year literacy assessments, and so we did our, our dibbles, and um, and then our map is coming up. But what our dibbles showed us is that um, that we're we're still we've got work to do still in making sure that we're hitting those literacy standards, and that we've got our foundational skills ready to go in literacy, and um, we discovered that um, there's some anomalies that are happening in fifth grade. And so we saw the beginning of the year data. Now we're looking at the middle of the year data. We saw some things in the middle along the way. And, and what we were doing in fifth grade, we knew that we had to make an adjustment. So we've had um, four or five meetings where we can pull our fifth grade team together and our reading specialist and our special education person and me. And we've all been sitting around the table and looking at, okay, what can we do? Because we're seeing that, that there's some gaps and we're not quite sure what exactly those gaps are. Well, from the time that we got the dibbles done last Wednesday to, um, to between last Wednesday and Friday, we figured out that what we wanted to do is pull every student in fifth grade that was looking like they were experiencing challenge and give them a phonics screener, which seems so like by fifth grade, you, see, you kind of think that kids are reading to, to learn, not learning to read. But because of the gaps that were created over the last several years, we discovered that two-thirds of the kids that were having struggles in reading, it's phonics-based. 
And so what we have done now, between last Friday and now, is the teacher team and all the rest of us have come together and they have figured out that for the last 45 minutes of every day, they're gonna do differentiated groups where two classrooms are going to be dedicated to smaller groups. So there's gonna be 10 kids in, in each of these two classrooms that are just doing phonics instruction. And then the third classroom is going to be doing on grade level novel study. And then, um, and then we're gonna bring in uh, one of our interventionists to support during that time. And that classroom is going to do um, small group book groups that are um, at seventh grade plus reading level because that's the other thing that we've got. We've got this weird thing happening in fifth grade that we've got um, about 25 of our kids that are at seventh grade plus. So we need something for them. So they're going to have what they need and what I need. Everybody's gonna kinda of get what they need and then we're gonna hit that phonics really hard. And then the other thing that we were able to do when we're kinda of figuring this out is that we know like our second grade teachers, they are phonics pros. Like that's, that's their bread and butter. That's what they do every day. And our fifth grade teachers are like, ah, I'm not so sure how we, cat, mat, sat, huh? and so um, so our fifth grade teachers have no ego in it, and they were totally great with saying, hey, second grade teachers, can we do some swapping initially, or can we do some modeling? And so I'm able to do some creative moving of people around to cover some spots, so our second grade teachers can go in and support the fifth grade as they're launching this initiative to teach the fifth grade teachers how to teach the phonics in a really fun and engaging way. So. That's how we hit the multi-tiered systems of support to make sure that, that we're taking the experts in every area and hitting exactly what we need to do to drill down to the skills that kids need in order to meet those gaps and move us forward. Next slide. Because <laughs> it'll be more of the same. Well, and so we'll, we'll, we'll go to math and then we'll go back to, to ELA here in a minute. So, um, so, you know, this is our fall maps course. Uh, we have work to do, yes. Yeah. Are we looking at yeah. I'm about. Reds or uh huh. Or yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So what we're looking at here is um, so this is kind of approaching standard. Green is at standard and blue is above standard. Um, orange is you know the land of opportunity. We're we're getting there. And then red is we got a lot of work to do. So um, we got a lot of work to do. And so one of the things that we have been struggling with, and you know. And I came in tonight, you know, sometimes I'm all sunshine and rainbows, but I'm also going to be a little bit of the dark cloud too, is that having a good math assessment um, that we can use as a progress monitor, we, we haven't yet found that what a good math assessment that we can be giving on a regular basis that can drill down to the level of specific need. Map is really good as far as a three times a year benchmark to look at growth and it does have a lot of really good information about um, strand data, so particular areas that students may be struggling in more than others, but as far as a progress monitoring tool so that we can consistently be checking to see if what we're doing is working, um, Map isn't as effective in that regard, um, whereas we have a a lot of things for literacy that can tell if we're hitting the target or not. So um, what I've done right now, given that we knew that our fall map data wasn't super stellar, we're about to go into our, um, our, into our winter map. Um, I am fortunate that we have a math specialist who was a paraeducator in our building for the last four years, and he just completed his certification. And, um, and he is interested in applying for a job that I am posting um, with a little, little slice of money that I have left that will allow us to have a math specialist three days a week who, um, and so it's not necessarily him yet, it's posted, um, but um, we have several people that could then really drill down and do that daily progress monitoring and, um, and so the person that will be fulfilling this role will know the data, know all of our Eureka levels, know what the foundational skills are to be successful in the next level, and then um, one of the things that we're working on is not putting out the fire once it's started, but preventing the fire before it begins. And so front loading some of the lessons that are coming up with those foundational skills that may be the stumbling blocks before they get into the lesson. And, um, and so that's what we're kind of getting after in math. So, um, 
In math and ELA, um, my CSIP goal is that all students will make a year of growth. And so starting from where they're at and getting to where they need to be, a year of growth is um, in, in a school year, we should make a year of growth. And given the fact that we have gaps, I would like to see more. But, you know, we're, we're going to make sure year of growth and then we're also going to hopefully see more. So that is the math plan right now. Go on. Oh, and here's all the, the more colors. And they're, they're pretty, um, they, they correlate pretty well. Map and dibbles, the only difference between the colors here is that map has the orange and dibbles doesn't. So this was fall dibbles. Um, I would love to sit here and I really hoped that I was gonna be able to come out and be like, yes. And between fall and winter, we made all the growth and these red bars are so small now. And I can't say that. Um, but what I can say is that um, based on, you know, Dibbles is one measure that we take that's three minute test twice or three times a year. Um, I can say that all but two students out of the 400 students that took the assessment um, showed growth. Um, so, so nobody is making backward slides. What, what is happening though, which is disheartening and which is what we're getting after, is that this is norm referenced based on um, time of year. So we would expect that fourth graders would be, uh, I'm just gonna make up numbers, that fourth graders would be at a 200 in the winter, or in the fall, and then they would be at a 225 in the winter. Well, like let's say that our fourth graders that were at a 200 at the fall um, have only made like to 220 in the winter. So actually, we've seen um, some of these uh, red and yellows get bigger between fall and winter. So that was one of the reasons why we've had some really difficult conversations over the last week about, so what are we doing and what can we do differently? And to be quite honest, one of the things that, that we were doing um, really, really well is um, uh, dedicating ourselves with fidelity to the new Wit and Wisdom curriculum. And it's got really great materials, and it's really, um, it, uh, depth of knowledge is really meaty. Um, and, and also, because many of our kids were, were missing some of those foundational skills that weren't grade level skills, we weren't addressing those in the way that we have in the past. And so um, we have made a concerted uh, effort and focus moving forward that we are going to continue to use our Wit and Wisdom curriculum as our core curriculum for that tier one. Um, however, we are going to really pull it down, and I know you guys had fun last night with PLC conversations. So we are really going to be talking about what's most essential. Like, okay, so we've got this really beefy unit that's got um, teachers are, are saying that if, you, if you're teaching it with all the fidelity and all the things, it's looking at like two to two and a half hours a day. And what we need to do, like uh, for example, sixth grade, we were talking in our meeting that they were doing about two hours of ELA a day. Well, what sixth grade had committed to is that what we're going to do is we're going to scale that back to get most essential from the wit and wisdom in that at tier one and then they're gonna call out a 30 minute block each day that's ELA win time that they're gonna um, structure kind of in a daily five model where during that 30 minutes, they're really getting after those, those essential pieces that, um, that are not at grade level, maybe below or above, but that's where we can get into the intervention, the at and the extension piece to make sure that we're meeting every child's needs. There's that. We'll keep going. Unless there's questions about ELA. No, nope. we'll keep going. Um, so one of the things that we're really committed to at Roosevelt is our social, social emotional learning. I think I say that four times fast, obviously not tonight. Um, and so we, um, we are just, this is something that we're just spending a lot of time and energy as a staff because we know that until um, students feel regulated and safe, they can't be in a place where their brain is able to access learning. And, um, and so there's just, there's a lot of work to do around students and anxiety um, and students and connection and community because of what we've been through over the last three years. So we are super invested in that as a tier one. We do core instruction in SEL for all of our students. 
Roosevelt is the only school right now that is, um, is utilizing um, our counselor for, um, as part of our master schedule. So what I mean by that is that um, our counselor meets with every class every week for 30 minutes to do a community building or individual self-regulation lesson. And she's using, well, I'll get into that in a minute. And so we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. But, but that's part of our core instruction. Um, another part of our core instruction is uh, Character Strong lessons. So Character Strong is being built in into every, um, every classroom every week. Um, and then the third thing that we've been super, super uh, intentional around is um, morning meetings or class meetings. So there's an expectation in our building that every class has a meeting, um, you know, daily, if not three times a week. Um, and we have a really specific format where they're, everybody is sitting down and sharing and, and problem solving together. And so, um, you know, even just this morning, we had a, an incident that had happened yesterday. And Wendy Anderson, who's working as our dean, was able to go into that classroom. It was very natural because um, they're used to sitting down and, and talking as a community about what was the harm that was done. And so it's a lot of the, those restorative practices that are able to be implemented because we've created these communities in our classrooms. Um, so in order to create all these communities and do all these things, we have to empower our staff to, to have the skills necessary to do that. Um, so that's another um, amazing thing that Sabrina's taken on. Sabrina Caverly is our new uh, counselor at Roosevelt. And so she has spearheaded the MTSS SEL team, or SEL MTSS team, whichever way you want to say it. And so um, she's working with a small group that I sometimes get to work with when I have, I'm fortunate enough to be able to pop in thinking about what, um, what, what are we seeing school-wide as far as challenges go, and then how can we design core instruction in order to meet those challenges. And then um, we, of course, have monthly staff meetings like everybody else. And at our monthly staff meetings, our MTSS team is giving PD to our staff. And it's, it's been really good conversations around kind of some aha moments where um, people are like, oh yeah, I used to do that, and I stopped. Why did I stop? And so it's a, it, 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 we're not reinventing the wheel in any way, shape, or form. We're just dusting it off and taking it out of the garage again. Like this, this worked, remember? And so, um, so those have been really nice ways to share with each other um, strategies that have worked. Do you want to go to the next one, and then I can show off Sabrina a little bit more. Okay, so uh, that, there's Sabrina. She has a classroom. She doesn't go around to other people's classrooms, so they know when they come to Counselor Corner, it's time to be focusing on building community and problem solving and learning skills. Sabrina uses Character Strong. She also has brought in all of the pieces along um, with Kelso's Choices, and so we have all of Kelso's Choices um, signage um, all over. Uh, our building and out on our playground and all of our playground our recess people they they have these um, little lanyards that have the little flip cards on them um, and, and so when students are having problems on the playground they can make a counselor's choice or when they come to the office they can go through the flip cards and they can point to what choice they they're gonna make in order to solve their problem um, so Sabrina's done a really nice job of empowering students to identify whether it's a big problem or a small problem and um, if it's a small problem how can they solve it and if it's a big problem what would um, a big problem be and if it's a safety problem how would you solve it so that has been um, really really nice because kids are using common language and we're using that in classrooms too um, to help build their capacity to solve their own problems um, okay so that is what we're doing around the area of SEO and then we are all super um, focused on our connection with the arts. Uh, that's been something that we've really gotten into this year. We're very, very um, grateful for the partnership that we have with Peninsula Performs from the Field Arts Center. And um, so our second grade and our fifth grade have not shied away from um, calling out for those artists to come and connect with us at school. So we've had a um, science and dance lesson for second grade. We've had a marine debris art lesson in fifth grade. Um, we've got, um, we had another presenter that came and did some, some painting that had to do with um, the first um, 
wit and wisdom lesson in second grade. So these artists have been coming in and um, they we really, really love what they're bringing in and, and making it, it just fits exactly in what we were doing, connecting to our community and also enhancing the arts. So, um, and then we've also, uh, we were really fortunate we got to do kind of like a, a fifth grade version of like a Peyton sip without the sip. They're, they really <laughs> enjoyed it. Um, I think I got some more on the next one too. Um, so, oh, it'll be the next one after that. It's okay. So uh, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, we are committed to um, both of the things that I've been just talking about incessantly here is, is um, community, building community, and to um, building capacity in our teacher teams to address student needs. And so we are able to um, kind of put both of those things together by having weekly assemblies. So what we've done is we've built our master schedule so that every Friday afternoon, we come together as a whole school community. And we celebrate things and we um, get, um, we have different speakers come in and, and I'll talk a little bit about each one of those things of what we're doing, but the, the the fun for me is that I get to facilitate these assemblies, and then the fun for our grade level teachers is that they are supervised by our paraeducators and the admin team, and so our grade level teachers every Friday afternoon have a 35 minute block of time that they are able to meet just uninterrupted, and it is a focused time on looking at the standards, looking at student work, looking at um, the data, and then making um, really educated decisions, gosh, tonight it's hard for me, decisions on what they're gonna do in the coming week. And the, the other beautiful thing about having them all have that time simultaneously is we could also do vertical teaming. So we've had the opportunity for like second and third grade to meet, and so third grade to say, we're noticing that this, they're coming in with this gap. Do you think you could do a little bit more of that so that they would be ready then to, to just like hit the multiplication when they get here? Or um, sixth grade's able to work with fifth grade and say, you know, the, the main idea, they've got that down, you can do a little bit less of that, but supporting details, it seems to be that's kind of an issue. So that vertical teaming piece, um, we're really committed to having like, having it be a beautiful through line all the way up and through so that everybody is supporting the work of everybody else. We're also, uh, we've also gotten back to doing character awards, and so we're doing the Character Strong um, uh, trait of the month, and so we do, we, we're doing two months at a time, so it's not just like, well, here we go again, another awards assembly, but it's it, it gets them excited because every two months we get to honor um, about 50 kids and I read their name and I say a little bit about each one and they you can see they get really excited to stand up in front of everybody and then we get we invite families and and families of families and um, and they get their chance to get their picture taken and they're um, and they and just loved on by their classmates so that's another way that we're building community and um, reinforcing the character strong traits and then the next one We've also been able to enhance the arts through these too because we, we had the adventures in music and we've got the harmonica man that's come once and then we're also going to have a drum person come next and then I don't know what they have in store for us for the spring, but we've also invited Studio 360 and so they came and they did um, uh, pieces from their holiday performance for us and uh, the fun there is that it's, it's um, highlighting the arts but it's also about half of the kids that are that came to perform are former Roosevelt students and or siblings or, or connected to Roosevelt students. So it was just really neat to have them have a homecoming and be able to give back to their school and um, do so in, in such a uh, beautiful artistic way. And then, um, uh, when I, I'm pointing as if Killian and, and Emma are still here, we've been really, really focused on um, building up the leadership traits of our sixth graders. So every sixth grader is connected to a younger grade level classroom. And so like on those Fridays when we have our assemblies, our sixth graders go to those classrooms five minutes before they're released for their assembly. And then the big kids, those, those three sixth graders that are assigned to that class, sit interspersed with their, their younger 
friends, and they help monitor their behavior. If somebody has to go to the bathroom, they're able to take them out, and, and uh, the vast majority of, of them take that responsibility very seriously, and it's wonderful role modeling, and it has really kind of beefed up what um, they do and how they're perceived and how they perceive themselves on, on our campus. Um, we also do, um, we had a massive food drive right before um, winter vacation, and so we call that the 12 days of giving, and each day there's a different, um, a different food item, so like a box of cereal or a thing of peanut butter or whatever that is, and so we brought in, I don't even know, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand pounds of food, and um, we, we begin with the distribution of that food to our own families. So we contact those families that we know are in need and ask if they need additional food supports for the holidays. And then we get, they get like a gigantic box of food from all of this, um, as well as a small Walmart gift card so they can get perishables. And, um, and then uh, Becca helped us out with any family that had transportation needs and couldn't come and get it. So she was able to deliver those to their families. And then um, sixth graders are here because each day of the 12 days of giving, they went to their assigned classroom and they, they gathered the food and they brought it in and then they helped us sort it at the end to make sure that it was equally distributed amongst the 50 families that we were giving it out to. So um, it was really a nice way to connect our internal community to our external community. We can keep going. And then, of course, because I put this together right in the December-January window, um, we go a little crazy around the holidays. And so there's just festiveness galore. And um, I just appreciate the festiveness that really highlights the fun that we have at school and the connection. It is very, very much a family feel at school. And so, um, and sometimes almost to a fault, uh, we have a mother-daughter team that work in the same classroom now, because uh, Julian's on with us. Um, we had three members of the Wood family working at our building as well, um, but we, um, Joel now works with um, our students with special needs, and so uh, we had a little faux fireplace going there for a while, and they all got to come up and have um, you know story time there at the fireplace with the rocking chair. And then we do a holiday sing-along. It's the last thing that we do before we leave for, for winter break. And Mrs. Kramer has had them practice different things um, coming up to the sing-along. And then we just all sing along. And obviously, they love it. So it's very, very fun. Our PTO is back involved, which is fantastic. Our PTO was pretty dormant there for a while. Um, so we've had takeovers every month. We set the uh, Papa Murphy's record for the amount, uh, their one day sales record. We doubled their one day sales record on our Papa Murphy's takeover. Um, our PTO also sponsored um, like holiday crafting. So every class got to come in and work with our um, volunteer <coughs> that came in and, and help them uh, make something special around the holidays. So it's just really nice to have um, our PTO back in our building and back out in our community. So we love that. And then finally, um, we, with our PTO, sometimes we do fundraisers and things, and so we did a um, punch card fundraiser, and, um, and we surpassed our goal by over $1,000, and so because of that, I agreed that I was a T-Rex for a day, so... <laughs> There we are, and I was just all over the building. And it was a Friday, so I was a T-Rex to lead an assembly, too. That's really entertaining. Um, but obviously, uh, it was totally worth it because that was the response all day long. And even though it was really, really warm in that T-Rex suit, it was totally 100% worth it. So it was pretty great. But that's that. I mean, we, we love to celebrate, and we love to work hard. And um, those two things together are why I love what I do, so thank you for allowing me to do it. <laughs> that's my, that's my spiel. <laughs> Questions? So hot in that suit? Real hot. <laughs> real, real, and, and I did it in like November. I didn't think I was gonna overheat, but wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you.
Isn't that the best? If you guys get tired of it, I want it back because I just love it. And, and it really is each and every one of their, their own handprints. And they decorated the woman ones. And, and the one that I just, like, just stands out to me so much. I have to point it out. This is our little pre-K three-year-old. Isn't she so cute? Those little nuggets. So thank you for what you do. Round of applause right back at you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wow, that was a lot of information. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. That's what we need is a lot of information. Now we're going to turn to something that is also very exciting for our district, and that's the Education Foundation. I see Michelle out there. Ready to come give us a presentation? Yeah, it's really like hard to follow Jennifer because I do not have the same like <laughs> dance moves and cheerleading voice but I've seen you be pretty excited goodness <laughs> sakes I'll do my best basically reading notes that our director sent me but, um, so I'm Michelle Turner I am the um, president of the Port Angeles Education Foundation board this year and maybe for two years I'm also I have been the chair of the allocations committee which is the teacher grants um, that we've done every year for many, many years. So I have a dual dual role in the, on the board this year. The Port Angeles Education Foundation was started in 1991. Oh, and I wanted to tell you, I went to Roosevelt, but it was when it was in middle school. You were the and I remember walking the loop, and I um, was not like those two students that always followed the rules. I and my friend Angela Yee decided to rebel, and we wore shorts. Ooh. Are shorts allowed now? They're like cargo shorts, like to our knees, and we got um, our parents got called and we got sent home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. See that the was things that you remember? Really the most exciting thing I ever did. <laughs> wild time. It was a wild time. <laughs> cargo shorts. Anyway. I won't even tell you what was bad for that. Yeah, no, they were long and baggy. There's nothing that we got sent home. I think we were kind of proud about that. Um, so back to the Education Foundation. Uh, it was started in 1991. Um, our mission is to foster support for students and programs by promoting creativity, innovation, and excellence in partnership with the Port Angeles Public Schools. Um, our vision is that all students have full access, free of barriers to reach their full potential. Um, we just want every child or student to have equal opportunities to succeed in school and life. Um, we hope that no child or student should be restricted by their inability to acquire the basic needs which allow active participation. participation in classes and activities. Um, so we have three main components that we do. One is basic needs, one is scholarships, and one is school and teacher grants. The basic needs is just as it sounds, we work at the, with the school district, um, counselors, family navigators, um, any staff person, and we assist students with medical and basic needs, including um, eye exams and glasses. We partner with um, George Simons and his son through the, their optometry practice. Um, because inter I also work at the children's clinic, so I have a lot of knowledge about like what health insurance covers for children and what it doesn't. And interestingly, um, optometry is really hard to access care right now in Port Angeles. A lot of the opto we have amazing optometrists, but a lot of them uh, about two years ago dropped their contracts with like Molina and Apple and coordinated care and, and Medicaid, the, the programs that support by kids, um, yeah, um, health insurance. So it's a it's a hard thing to access now. Uh, so we cover yeah, eye exams, glasses, um, counseling, which actually now is better covered. You can send any kid. We can send any kid to uh, Peninsula Behavioral Health with any in state insurance type, and they will they'll get counseling services. But we still will cover counseling for kids that can't access that or don't have ways to, that their parents can get them to PDH. Um, we do clothing vouchers. We used to do clothing vouchers. Um, uh, families used to be able to choose between Walmart and Goodwill. And um, we realized that kids just, if they need clothing, they don't want to go to Goodwill. Although now it's like a trend. My daughter is big into Goodwill, like all of her friends are. So I think it's cool again. But, but you know, if you want new clothes, then um, we now actually contract with Swain's, which I love because it's local. So now if kids need specific clothing items, they'll get a, a voucher to uh, Swain's. Um, we cover PE uniforms that are required um, and graduation gowns if kids need them. Um, we also provide financial contributions to AmeriCorps. Uh, we have Michelle Gentry come to our board every year and present what her needs are. And then um, ASB activities, we used to give money for kids that didn't have money to buy ASB cards, but now it's different. It's required that you guys supply them, so it's just a little different, but we, we <coughs> contribute to that. 
The second main component of what we do is scholarships. Um, the Port Angeles Education Foundation is the largest donor of local scholarships to Port Angeles students. Last year we awarded 53 scholarships totaling $319,950 to graduating seniors. An additional $95,000 was dispersed to 14 students who are currently um, sophomores, juniors, or seniors and continuing in their studies at college. Since the year 2000, we have awarded more than uh, $3.1 million to more than 600 students in the Port Angeles School District. The last of the three is the school and teacher grants. Um, we call them SPICE grants, which stands for Supporting Projects of Innovation, Creativity, and Excellence. School and teacher grants are available for creative and innovative ideas in the classroom and in the field. Um, two of the things Jennifer mentioned that Roosevelt does, like going to the Point Defiant Zoo and uh, Erica Cook taking her kids almost yearly to the children's um, theater in, in Seattle, those are two examples of what we fund. So we're very proud to be able to allow kids, as she said, for the first time, sometimes even go to Hurricane Ridge or to Lake Crescent or especially to Seattle to a production. It's, it's pretty exciting. Um, this year, we, we awarded 36 grants, totaling nearly $69,000 to spark children's interest by providing opportunities that go beyond basic classroom curriculum. Um, some of the augmented um, monies we have now are like the Rich Boyd grant for the arts. He was a teacher at the high school. Um, the Patty Reifenstall Memorial Fund. She was a para uh, educator at Franklin, and she also um, coached and taught swimming at the pool. Uh, the Trudy Kindler Native American Studies Fund. Um, Bill Kindler used to be on our board and was our president. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yours, yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. He left us to go to you. That's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, and then he left all of us to move. <laughs> lovely, lovely family. Um, and then the Joe Glatz, who is um, Claire Rausch. A lot of you probably know her. She was a teacher at Franklin, and she retired, but her husband who passed away, it's called the Rocket Man, um, and that specifically goes to like science-based um, projects. So teachers can apply every year, and they can apply to the general fund that we provide, or they can specify if their grant um, fits the criteria for these, like the four that I just mentioned, like specific criteria. Um, and a, kind of a newer thing we have, this will be the second year of it, is called the Welker Classroom Incidentals Grant. Um, which we're currently taking applications for and what its purpose is to reimburse teachers for supplies and materials that they would probably buy anyway and just use their own money and not ask to be reimbursed but um, so they can submit uh, receipts if they're selected it we unfortunately have many last year was the first year and many more teachers submitted grant or applications for this than we had the money for so we're hoping to grow this but they submit their um, receipts and we reimburse them for buying things for their own classroom. Um, this effort is funded by a donation from a graduate of Port Angeles High School who, who moved back to this area when he retired. Uh, uh, the foundation collaborates with other organizations who share our purpose to encourage learning and inspire kids. This year we are sponsoring activities and programs with Caring for Kids, which is the clothing closet that Jennifer um, Riffle and Jessica Johnson run, um, which is a really amazing clothing closet. Uh, they also do a program around Christmas time where they, um, I don't know, they sponsored like 95 kids this year and gave them complete outfits and additional things for Christmas. Um, the Clallam Resilience Project, the Dolly Parton Imagi Imagination Library. Do um, you guys know what that is? Yeah, they, you can get books for kids zero to five every month. It's pretty cool. Uh, the Field Art and Events Peninsula Performs. I know you mentioned that. Um, and. Kayla Oaks is on our board and she's liaison because she also contracts with the Field Arts Center, so that's a nice connection that we have. The Wanda Fuca Festival Kids Day and then the Lutheran Services uh, Back to School Fair that I know you're all a big part of. Um, another thing we do is the Academic Achievement Awards. Um, only two students this year actually qualified from the class of 2023 20, seniors. Um, they were honored for the Academic Achievement Award, which is earning a 3.5 GPA every semester for the first three years of high school um, while taking at least nine honors, advanced placement, or University of Washington courses. Um, this might be tweaked in the future because there are less and less AP classes, but there are more like university level classes offered at the high school, so we'll have to, we might have to adjust the numbers on that. Uh, another thing we do is the 50th class reunion. Last fall, we were able to hold a 50th class reunion event for the first time since 2019 because of COVID. Um, about 30 members of the class of 1971 
uh, met for breakfast at Port Angeles High School, catered by Sodexo. Uh, Principal Tanner's art gave a presentation and he gave them a tour of the high school, which I think is funny because it probably was exactly the same as when they went there. Worse, actually. I mean, yeah, right. It's my wad of gum under that table, yeah. Um, Port Angeles Education Foundation, Foundation's first student board member was Zelby Gloria. She's currently a senior at the high school. She's decided that she's done with her term and we're gonna be recruiting for another student member um, this spring. That, oh wait, hold on, page three. Um, district employee donations. Thank you for allowing uh, your employees of the district to donate directly to the, our foundation through payroll deduction. We appreciate the support of those who are making monthly gifts or cash donations. And thank you to our school district liaisons, um, to the Education Foundation to keep us informed on issues and needs of the students and staff of Port Angeles School District. School board member Sandy Long, who always comes to our meetings, um, Superintendent Marty Brewer, who often comes to our meetings, and then Jefferson Elementary Principal Rhonda Baum, is she? Yes, I knew it was who often is via Zoom at meetings, right? Yes. Um, Shelly Zol, it's kind of funny. This is Shelly Zolman. She is our PR director. So we have Shelly Z and Shelly T because most people call me Shelly, not Michelle. So it gets very confusing. Um, but yeah, we. Uh, she and we've has known each other since we were little too. Yes, so I graduated with her younger sister. Um, good friend. <laughs> no bad juice. No bad blood. She um, is great to have. She works with Carmen a lot and she, our, what we want to work on is getting our name and our, because a lot of people don't even know who we are or what we do. And so we're trying to get out there and be known what we do. And so that's why we brought Shelly on board and so far she's done an amazing job. She told me she has business cards. So if any of you want like her business card to contact her, that would be perfecto. So after Shelly's done, raise your hand and I'll drop one off to you. Because yeah. most of you, a lot of you know how to. Yeah, I feel like everyone <laughs> So um, that's it. Any questions? Any of the Sorority kids here are all, oh. all of the trans members of Sorority. Yeah. Right. And it was a class of seven who was real pregnant. <gasps> it was. was. <laughs> class. And Shelly assisted us, and our purpose was to hopefully get some donations by making our graduating class yes. aware. So I, yeah. over time, I'm hopeful that other yeah. classes. Oh, oh, good, 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 yes. Oh my gosh, I know, yes. When we were in music. And then, then they saw a lot of the big tracks in the um, area of like cars and different things. Like yeah, the automotive. Auto and, the yeah. Doc and they were just so impressed that the progress there that they just realized, like, they, this is their future. Yeah. So well, that was a good move. We always want to do more, you know, because there is a need, but yeah, we're happy to do it. We appreciate it. We appreciate so, it. lots. Thank you so much. Well, it's an amazing board, and I enjoy working with you. Thank you. We're a fun so group, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. They are so patient. Some of us. Some of us. <laughs> yes, we try to be spunky. <laughs> As are you guys? Thank you. Thank, I, yeah, I know it's hard. Like, it's, I didn't like to follow her, but anyways. But you're giving money out. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just said, yeah. Yeah. All right, more, more, please. So. Well, thanks for, yeah, thanks for inviting me, and, and thank you all for your service. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. Yes, there's a lot of interesting stuff.
Bringing it down. <laughs> That's, are you calling her the valley? The, it's, it's pretty cool. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's some stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, but you know, there are some also some good things, lots of good, a little bit of, we tried to couch that, you know. We did the, we did the hamburger, you know, like good, a little bit, you know, and then. I don't either. No. Yes, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's not. I'm not really gonna present. I'm not like Jen. I don't. You know. It's like Tigger, right? She's like Tigger. You know, like. Yes. And this is after a day of working with kids all day, and she's still like. Yeah, she's amazing. So, we we. When we started putting this together, Michelle wanted to kind of do an overview of starting at our youngest and going all the way through um, what's happening mm -hmm. with our high school kids. So we thought we'd start with our walk kids assessment, which happens every year. So this, the data is actually the data from this fall for our walk kids. You can go ahead and pull that up, Jenny. So let me just explain that the state numbers for this year are not out. So we have our state numbers from last year and our district numbers from last year. And then the light green is our district numbers from this year. And one of the things that's really exciting is, although we're not right at the state level, uh, last year's state level, you can see that in every area, we've got an upward trend of how many of our students, how many of our element or our kindergarten students we're ready in all six domains for kindergarten. So this assessment assesses, evaluates all of our incoming kindergarten students in all in the following do, in these domains: cognitive, language, literacy, math, physical, and social emotional. And then it judges whether they are ready for the education that they're going to get if they're ready for instruction in those areas. So. While we're not at state levels, you can see that we've had this huge increase from last fall to this fall with our kids' readiness and coming in, and that's pretty exciting. Our biggest gap between the state was that 6% in our social-emotional, but, you know, we're still going up, so that's exciting. This just looks at how many of our students were ready in zero areas to six areas. So we have this huge increase from 38 to 49% of our students were ready for, showed kindergarten readiness in all six areas. We had a drop here, but this was only a drop of actually 0.75 of a student. When you look at it, I mean, it looks like there's a huge drop, but that 3% really just represents one student. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Three-fourths of a student went down when you look at the actual numbers. So, Because I was like, ooh, that's a big drop. And then I'm like, oh, there were only 24 kids that weren't ready. And there were 23 last year. So um, again, we're seeing much better numbers here. 
so that's kind of exciting. Our kids are a little bit more ready. Our kindergartners are a little bit more ready. One of the things that I think is contributing to that, and then this as well, um, you can see that we've got, oh, did it come? Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, you can see that trend upward. We started our TK program last year, and I'm, I really think, I mean, I don't have any evidence, but, but usually those kids that go into our TK program are the students that are really not ready for kinder. We, t we test them and we evaluate the kids that are the most um, in need of that early intervention and that early instruction. And so I really feel like that is partially responsible for that huge amount of growth because those students are getting the early intervention. And last year we had 31 TK students. So I, that accounts for a lot of that movement upward. Those students are now coming into kindergarten ready to learn. And I'll jump in on that one. The part of the transitional kindergarten, those are not just students who have any, those are students who do not have access and have not attended any um, preschool. And so they don't have the same, that's one of the, that's one of the criteria is that they don't have access and haven't attended preschool before. So we're getting those students who don't have that kind of access in their homes until this program. Exactly, and we had a chance to partner with a lot of our community partners last year. We had a committee um, meeting with the Head Starts in the area, meeting with our ELWA Head Start program, and they were saying, we just don't have enough room. We don't have, our concern was that they would be concerned that we were taking kids from their program, and they're like, no, we have lists of kids that, you know, we have a waiting list that we can't get, our, we can't get students into. And so this, I feel like it's been a program that's, very helpful to the community as well as those students. And I'm telling you, hats off to those transitional kindergarten teachers because there's sometimes when I'm testing one on one with that student and I'm like, I can't control them. You know, they're out of, they're everywhere. So um, I, they are, and they're so cute. One of the one of the questions in the one of the questions on the test was is something about if you broke a friend's toy, what what would you do? And one of my little girls was like, find a new friend. Like, <laughs> not gonna, not even gonna try it, man. Just find a new friend. <laughs> They're fun. Right? Yeah, so um, one thing I wanna add is my observation of this program. So you can see definitely the development that we see. And there is a correlation, even though we may not be able to pinpoint. But there is a correlation between that increase that you see from the 2021-22 school year to 22-23 to our TK program. But the observations are, you know, and as, as um, has been outlined, uh, these, are, these are kiddos that don't have school experiences, don't have much socialization prior to their TK experience, but when they experience a year of TK and then they transition it into kindergarten or into kindergarten, they're really like the leaders of the class. Because think about it, they have spent a year in that school, they know the rules, they know, you know where the bathroom is, and so they really, it, it, it flips that whole, you know, rather than being behind from the very first day they are you know class leaders and so it, it is a it is a phenomenal program that um, we have implemented in our school system and um, hopefully we can continue to you know strive to do more I agree and and watching the growth just between you know seeing them in the schools and the child that I'm trying I was trying to test that really like it took three of us to try to wrangle him back into my room. Uh, he was, I saw him at Roosevelt, and he's walking down the school in a line, and I'm like, is that the same child? So yeah, Molly's a, Molly, Hibbler. Molly Hibbler. She is a miracle worker. Because so. The other thing that, that we, you know, that is probably most likely a contributing factor is that our ELWA partners have done an amazing job with with their Head Start program and with and their pre Head Start program, and you can see that there's a slight dip here, but we also had COVID during that time. So, looking at that growth from 2019 to 2021, I think is also a contributing factor for how many of our students are coming into our Kinder programs ready to learn. So, super exciting. Less exciting. 
They are not available yet for this year. Yeah, I, I even emailed OSPI to see if they could give me a heads up on any of it, and they said it's coming out in a month, hopefully. So, all right, we're going to look at our now our higher education. Um, this represents our students who are graduating in four years over time. We've and this includes all of the schools in the district. So all of our, it's Seaview, it's Lincoln, and it's PHS, um, PAHS. We had a little dip last year district-wide, or yeah, <coughs> district-wide. However, our high school numbers for graduation are still at 91.6% for last year. So they're quite a bit higher than across the district, um, which would make sense because often our students that are struggling with credits um, or struggling to complete school end up going to Lincoln or Seaview to try to make up those credits. And this isn't just graduation, this is graduating in four years. In four right. years, yes. The five-year graduation rate is higher than this. Mm -hmm. So COVID has definitely impact our students who are on track for graduation. Um, right now, 60% of our ninth graders are on track for graduation, which means that 40% of our, of our current ninth graders are not on track. Um, there are several factors that contribute to that. Regular attendance is one of those that, that we saw as a contributing factor. At ninth grade, halfway through the ninth grade years, how are we talking about right now? Is it the current freshman? No, it's the current. This is last year's, so there are current mm -hmm. tenth graders. And is there a way to correct this? There is. I'm glad you asked. And I'll. <laughs> Ron is going to talk about some of the plans that that they have for the high school for correcting so it because hope is, not lost. hope is not lost. No. Well, do you want us to answer as we go along? Sure. Yes. Yeah, really so, yeah. so, so, come on up, Ron. Don't leave me hanging up with them. Those watching from home. That might be a minute. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it was black. It so, it needs to be on when you talk because it goes through to. We'll do. Yeah, next time. I forgot. Yeah. Okay, so the high school has lots. So, we're going to see some of these dips that have been affected by everything we've all gone through. And, we're, and like the state, we're in a recovery mode right now and trying to address all of the getting students back into school. And, and buying into school and attending school. So right now what they've got are up there in, for math and DLA and math, they've got some focused math classes. AmeriCorps is providing tutoring. There are some co-taught math classes where di two different teachers are coming in and working together. They have a specialized geometry class. Students who don't make it through geometry the first time come back and go through a, a second spin through a geometry class that's more supportive and takes them through so they're still getting their geometry credit and another end and then credit recovery for that math. There are learning strats classes, and AVID is being used. Um, for the after-school tutoring, there are Tuesday and Thursday buses in places, and there are teachers who have open tutoring sessions that are being paid to be there after school, and as incentives, they're doing raffles, they're doing different things for those students who would show up for the tutoring. Um, and ELA, the same thing. There's AmeriCorps tutoring, specialized learning recovery classes, and they've introduced back some um, creative writing, business writing, and journalism as English courses that might entice the, the students to come back in and be more involved and recover uh, English class as well at that time. Um, staff is getting uh, PD in um, data mining for the map. So like how do they take that map assessment apart and find out what we need to focus on? And there's uh, work happening right there. They're all doing uh, UDL training right now with Ann Ranker, the University uh, Designs for Learning. And, um, and so they're going through that training and finding ways to put supportive stuff on the walls. They've got 12 powerful words, um, which is an education thing that I can't really talk about. <laughs> but they've got those posters up on the walls, as in I don't know that much about it. Um, I know they've also implemented having learning um, objectives on every board <laughs> every day, and they're incorporating those 12 powerful words and identifying them in their learning objectives with students every day. Um, as far as attendance goes, the Native American interventionist is working with the attendance secretary and they're watching attendance every day, period by period, and a different focus on each period each day so they can identify students who are 
unexcused and missing classes, and then they're following through with a detention for those students, and then classwork and support in there as well as attendance um, program sort of things. They're walking the kids through and trying to get them to attend um, better. And they're creating a template of some sort. I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's tracking the different interventions that they're using for attendance and how those are working. Um, and then other things that are happening are um, consistent um, administrative walkthroughs in the classrooms. Um, vape detectors are in the buildings, and if they get caught vaping, they have to go through a vaping you know, a program of some type, or they're learning the pitfalls of, of vaping, and so there's some education tied to that. And those are a few of the things that Tanner, um, I know he shared some in his CSIP um, when he presented last month, and then he and I just sat down, and I'm like, tell me what you're doing to address all of these needs, and these are the things that um, he was able to share just off the top. So they're putting a lot of things in place to address all of these, and, and they see it. They see it, and they're trying to address it all. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. How does this compare to last year or years prior? That's a really good question, and I'm not sure that I have that. But I think okay. that I can find it. Is it up? Wasn't, wasn't oh, that rates yeah. over time? There it is. Oh, oh, so. So that's, you oh, can see. Oh, yeah. It. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry. I even noticed. I was like, I thought I had that, but I'm looking through it. So thank you for knowing my PowerPoint slides better than That's I great do. Graph. <laughs> no, no. Very clear. So the seven period day, doesn't that help with credit keeping kids on track for graduation? I mean, that's one of the reasons that they started the seven period day, and yet we're not seeing the rates. In, but we're saying this is attendance and COVID related and not we don't know. I do day. think that there are some fact. I mean, I do think that those factor in. We definitely are seeing different things with students than we've dealt with with our high school students in the past. And I think that COVID got a lot of kids out of this, the habit of coming to school, out of the habit of gauging, engaging, and out of being comfortable engaging with other people. Um, and there's a lot of anxiety coming back in for, for a variety of reasons. But I do think that that, I mean, I don't have any data to show that, but, but just in conversations with teachers and with students, that seems to be something that, that I'm going to assume is a factor. Um, attendance. Yeah, so that, just a little more on that, mm -hmm. Katie. That, so a seven period day does technically give more opportunity to fail, right? You know, because we need 24 credits to graduate. And the seven period day will give a total allocation of 28. So um, if we were a six period day with that data, um, there could be a more concern. I mean, this, this is concerning data. There would be more concern if there were no room to fail a class. That was my curiosity, is that there's going to be just room in the schedule to, get, to catch back up. Yeah, it doesn't mean, I mean, if you fail a course, I mean, you have to retake the course, but mm -hmm. there's space in a schedule mm -hmm. of a student to be able to do that within a seven period day. Right. That's one of the advantages of, there are advantages mm -hmm. and disadvantages of the three by five, the six period day, the seven period day, but one of the advantages of a seven is there's more opportunity to make credits up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great insight. Um, our next graph shows our credits attempted during the 2021, or the 21-22 school year that resulted in missed credits so as you're looking at it, our, our biggest concern right now is the ninth graders, and those would be our current 10th graders. We have almost 20%, 19.7% of our, ninth, our current 10th graders that are behind by three or more credits. They have missed three or more credits. <clears throat> um, so a little concerned. They've got to be perfect all the way out pitch a perfect game from here on out. Yeah, they do. Right. And there are opportunities to recover those credits. And those are some of the things that Rhonda talked about. They really are working. They, they're aware of the issue and are working on putting systems into place to help students recover those credits and get back on track. The other thing that you'll see that really, I think, is contributing to, or data would show is probably contributing to some of that is um, this is our current 
these are the 10th grade, this is this year. So they're still, besides our kinder and first grade, which typically have the lowest, you know, have the lowest attendance, that same class, last year's ninth graders, this year's 10th graders have the lowest attendance across the district. Hmm. That's the, almost the exact percentage. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, you're right. Brewery is within a couple of points. I mean, I was about to say that within a couple <laughs> points, it's almost the exact percentage. So that does, but that really does tell you something. Um, the good news is that almost 78% of our students are not having issues with attendance. Um, regular, regular attendance is defined as missing less than two days per month. And so most of our students are here and they're learning. We're just, that group seems to be struggling a little bit. This is a uh, this slide here with the 2022 regular. So this is fall 2022. Yes, this and is current it, data. Does it take? What's the time period? It was right up until so Cedars pulls current data for us. So it was right up until I did the presentation. So probably last Wednesday. Okay, so from the start of the year until now. Yes, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I go ahead. I would like to say that um, a lot of those students have been very sick this fall with the flu that's yes. going around. So, I mean, our first glance, we're concerned, okay, they're staying home, they're not going to school, but I, I will attest to the fact that they have been a lot of illness this fall. So, it'll be interesting to see if this can improve. had a big loud voice um, I would also say that just from what we're seeing in the building that it's not even just that when they're sick at, we're still have all these remnants of COVID and so when people have their sneezing and they're coughing and things that they would have come to school before with like minor colds people are now keeping students at home because they've got symptoms or they're not sure if it's COVID and so I think that is still some carryover that's affecting attendance as well Does anybody have any other questions about this one? No, but thank you for rolling with the punches this way. It's yeah. way more no, interactive for us. Yeah, yeah, it helps a lot. Thank you. Let me, let me ask one question. Do you keep attendance data by, by demographic group? We do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd be happy to share that with you. I just wondered if, it, if that information was available. It is. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't include it, but That's I'll okay. note to you next time. I'll make a note for myself. You know, it's strange to ask for demographic data by, you know, or group data because it used to be against the law to do that. You could not identify okay. those groups that we now identify. It was uh, considered discriminatory. Oh, well, it does not that old. <laughs> do you, do you no, remember I, that I do. I do. We didn't do that, and now we know it's to our students' advantage for us to okay. know it what needs to was, be. It but it yes. was against. It was. It. Yeah. So, anyway, go yeah. ahead. Thank you. Um, so this this slide is the percentage of our students failing in math and English um, for 21-22. So you can see that, um, again, that 10th grade group struggling more than the others, but still a little concerning the number of students or the percentage of students that we have failing in the in their core classes. Mm. It matches the trades though. It does. It does. And it matches up with those that are missing credits. I said that it matches the attendance. Mm -hmm. And if you're not there, it's really hard to learn. Yes. So all right. But we have lots of systems in place that are gonna help help get us past that. Yeah, get them all back on track. So this is our data from the spring testing data, uh, our latest. Um, remember that we talked about last fall they tested. So last year they tested twice. Um, the 2021 is the fall test was considered their 2021 testing. Um, 
And the great news is that we, within the year, like if you look at our math, within the year, 10% of our students moved from not being on track to being on track. Um, again, we moved up here. Not sure what happened in science. Yeah. But we're still above the state, so I'm not sure if it was a tough, tough science test. I'm, it's different kids in science. If it's different kids in science. <laughs> because of the, the yes, ball. it is. It is. Because Thank you. They do it alternate grade level. Yes. And so we're looking at We're looking different at cohorts. different cohorts because it's it's our five uh, our fifth, eighth, and tenth grade are the student are the grades that students are tested in. And so we would be looking at a totally different group of kids. And, and it's our fifth grade. And you know, um, if you look at the from the 2020 through the 2021 school year, we closed schools on March 17th of 2020. Right. When we were delivering our hybrid model, our focus was not science. Our no. focus was math and ELA. Mm -hmm. So there is a definite you know correlation between like experience and exposure to science over those two years because. When we, in the 2021-22 school year, we spent our, let's see, was that the correct year? 2021, um, for secondary, it was a focus of math and ELA. Yes. That's another great observation. Thank you. Isn't it? Okay, yeah. So I'm trying to understand the data here. So when you say that the science is 45% in 2022, that's for all grades that took science? Yes, it's the combination of the fifth, okay. eighth, and tenth grades. And so with the math, you have grades two through three, three through three through eight, and then 10. OK. It would be and nice if you could include that next time for me. I will. I will do that. Oh, I think I did. Well, I broke it down on the next slide, I on see. the rest of the slide. So, okay. But I didn't break it down over time just for this year. OK. Thank you. Do that. So we, we can go ahead and move on to the next one. So this is our ELA, and this is the state versus the district, uh, and broken out by grade level. So you can see that with ELA, we outperformed the state in 10th and 6th and in 7th. Um, 8th, 3rd, and 5th, we were within 3% of the state. We've known that. We have some challenges in ELA, which is part of why we looked at adopting a new curriculum. And I do strongly believe that having the, new, the focus um, on the fundamentals, on phonics, on uh, our wit and wisdom curriculum, I have a lot of confidence that we're going to see those scores move in the, in the head in the other direction, moving up, because we well, when you compare our, the math data, you'll see that we're outperforming the state in almost all of our areas with the new, with Eureka Math. And that's exciting because math used to be the area that we were lower in. So it's kind of exciting to see that upward trend in math. May I ask a question? Uh, when we're looking at the state data, um, at the 10th grade, let's say, it's that 62% is um, all children in the state that were measured with that exam and only 62% met standard. Yes. <laughs> is that acceptable to the state? I mean, I look at these and look at the state things and that's just unacceptable in my opinion. It's so totally unacceptable. <clears throat> I'm really shocked. And I know it was a COVID. I'm, I'm, I know I have all that information up here. But that when you're looking at, you know, I just, yeah, that's just 49% and for fourth graders met standard. Help me. I'm like at six. I mean, and I'm glad when I see that we are exceeding the standard, <laughs> but it seems to me like the standards are very, very, low am i well that's that's why we're looking at this as our new baseline okay 
No, you're absolutely I, right. I, I, yes. I mean, I am truly, as an educator, forever. I mean, I just don't understand. I mean, is this a good way to describe what our children are doing across the state? Is me, you know, or we're we're so happy that we have 67 percent that met standard. I, I don't think that it's hyperbole when you hear people say a whole generation has been lost because of COVID, and we can mitigate. That's what we can do. We can mitigate. Well, we we are um, mitigating. I don't. I don't think furiously. you're ever. I don't think for the next no, ten years they're not gonna you're going to see a, a huge difference in this. I mean, these kids got hammered, and and their families got hammered. It's yeah. just. I mean, it's their a generation. food got hammered, and they don't have any place to live. And no, 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 no. Don't mistake. I'm not saying well, let's throw up our hands. No, we've no, lost this no, generation. No. There's nothing we can do. I don't believe that, but I do believe that we're not going to see a huge. Yeah. yeah. Another thing is like uh, last year, I, I was a sophomore, so our English teacher told us like the rates of people going into that class like he used to have like a hundred people like three classes like of sophomores in his honors 10 class and now the rates are there he has like 30 people 30 sophomores in his class so like the rates and not just like state testing but like honors classes and everything like there is dropping and that is across the state uh, new data just came out Monday um, from the state, and, and one of the things that they looked at was the attend, uh, uh, like overall students that were enrolled in school, and that is down across the state. Um, so that's another, you know, another thing that we're seeing. That's a really good observation because we are looking at fewer students. But I agree, we're kind of in triage mode right now. We we have some students that, you know. Last year, we had kindergarten students that were in third grade, and it was their first year having a complete year of school. Yeah. And there's some... It's like trying to build a building with no foundation. Right. I mean, it's just almost... Oh, it's so difficult to catch mm -hmm. these little ones up. It is. And some I mean, of you know, I'm an elementary person, and I... Uh, and really preschool, and I just... Uh, you know, I don't know. It's very difficult. And I do, and I've been out in the schools and listening to teachers talk about um, the new ELA program and the depth and the enrichment, but that the basic skills are not as emphasized. And a very small sample of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Hadn't talked to a million teachers, just a few. But um, having had some really interesting conversations about the new, and here it is, it's new for them, it's new for everybody, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we've got some real barriers. We do. That are, that are not our fault, you know, and, and the expectations, I think, of the public, I mean, I think if you put this out there in the public, you put this in the newspaper tomorrow, they wouldn't even know what this, I mean, they wouldn't have a clue. And, and that's okay because they, they're not trying to know what all this means and so forth and so on, but, but we are. And it is our job. And it is a scary <laughs> job right now. And when I think of the legislature meeting now, right now, with the $4 billion um, surplus and, what, and we're, all our federal funds are cut now for all the special interventions, that we've been doing for the last... For ESSER funds. For our right. ESSER funds are gone. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what we're going to do. This is the time to get on the phone, I guess. I don't know if that does any good or not, but... I'm looking forward to it. I think the data is going to be fascinating in about four years when we look at third grade in four years and against these third graders now. That's when we're going to know if the systems we are putting in place now actually have an effect. Wit and Wisdom, Eureka, if all those actually have an effect. Mm -hmm. I'll be, that's going to be interesting data. I, I yeah, I agree. The one thing that um, stuck out to me <laughs> is earlier you said good tier one instruction meets 80% of the needs of students, but we're not seeing that. And so, you know, our tier one instruction is, is you know, is on focus here, right? We should be 
yes, capturing. Kind of harkening back to what Jen was saying earlier, um, she's talking about how she, we now have those kids in the upper grades that are missing those foundational skills that are missing the phonics. And I believe, I mean, wit and wisdom has a true phonics component and the fundamentals. We've really gone into um, the science of reading and how that affects kids. And, and we took a step back and have moved more in that direction. And I think that our kids coming through this program are going to be stronger when they get into the upper grades. But I, I agree that we might have an issue with some of our kids that are supposed to be learning on grade level. Wit and Wisdom absolutely selects on grade level text. And because their philosophy is a student can't excel or even be at grade level if they aren't reading at grade level texts. However, that's a struggle then to get our kids on grade level and having them read those on grade level texts at the same time they don't have the foundational skills to read them. And so um, I think we're sort of caught in a, a little bit of between a rock and a hard place. And, and, and I know it will be worked out. I mean, I have all the faith in the world. I'm very optimistic. We looked very carefully through that curriculum, or I did, and looked at the phonics set and the whole separate uh, basic skills. That's what I used to call it. Um, but you know, there's always, those people that get past third grade and they don't have it. Yeah. You know, they just don't have it and they don't have it. And, uh, but now there are, there's a bigger group that don't have it. I mean, they're always there and they're always there and they'll always be there. But that, that group is so large now. I'm, you know, I'm hoping and praying that our teachers are, <laughs> you know, they are just able to keep up it just it's unnerving when I think when I try to put myself in their place every day mm -hmm. thinking of what they must be doing I, I'm very honored that they're out there I and y'all too our principals and the whole staff but just that daily trying to get those basic skills to everybody and we do give them to and there were times when we did not people just kind of sat in tier one and they were special and they didn't get it and they just sat there and we went on teaching tier one tier one tier one and and then they started ending up in tier two so anyway i appreciate this it's just amazing to me that the standards are to me I mean, it's below 50%. I just, I just think that's weird. If we don't slide? even expect 50% of our students to meet standards, it's just. The other okay. thing I worry about with that 10th grade group is the social emotional yeah. learning. And I feel like what that impact may have been more severe, they were in that eighth grade year. Would that be right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that transition, transitions are always significant oh. where we lose kids. So the transition between eight and going to high school, I mean, that compounds, in my opinion, the struggles that they're having. They missed middle school. Yeah. yeah. I believe, you know, like they got maybe five months of middle school, right. normal, you know, regular middle school, and then they were thrown into the high school. And I feel like middle school, really the job of middle school is to help prepare those kids to be ready to, to go be into ready high school. To, go, to make and that move. To make that move and to be you know, ready socially, academically, and I honestly feel like that is the group that has been hit the hardest. It would look that um, way. Mm -hmm. You know, not just just across the board, mm -hmm. ev you know, in every state, and it, like, I feel like that is the group that maybe, edu well, may and our very youngs, you know, our, our sure. kinders that were learning their foundational skills, but it's, it's definitely a struggle. Our math's a little better, though. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. So, um, in our math, we are outperforming the state in all but our fourth grade, and quite significantly uh, in most grades. Um, there's a slight difference, in, slight difference in third, but again, I feel like part of what's contributing to this is that we have we've adopted a strong math curriculum. We saw that we were lacking in math, that it was a struggle. 
and we adopted a strong math curriculum and we're seeing the payoff now um, as teachers are really learning it and knowing it now and feeling comfortable with it our our scores are much higher and math scores typically were below the state for a long time so I feel like this is a piece of good news yeah I think since I've been on the board Eureka has really made a difference I do too because uh, I can remember those first ones weren't so hot yeah, yeah. Well, I was at the elementary committee meeting yesterday and people are all the schools are using the ESSER funds to get more practice in math for our students so I feel like they're really using paraeducator time, teacher time, and they're continuing to hit the math in a cohesive way across the district. So I just felt like everybody had something that they were implementing to move kids. What do you call those little math. things they get every day and that's what they need? You know, exit tickets? Exit, exit tickets. I, wonderful. They're well done. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Okay. All right. And then our our science um, and again in science we're above the state even though we went down a little bit uh, we're above the state in all areas in our science as well so I want to state so when I stated um, the science um, statement earlier our secondary schools if you were in grades 7 through 12 you were still exposed to science because we ran the regular schedule when I said we made a focus of ELA and math that was K-6 there is an impact to that with regards to your fifth grade and your eighth grade scores so just want to make sure that I restated that more clearly other questions Thank you. This is just what we've been asking for. I appreciate all of you very much. We appreciate all of you. We do. We appreciate the good way that you put this together. Yeah. Yes. What I would like, honestly, is often it seems that we switch people who are on the committee and so on. And so I would love this data to stay. I would love this report to stay the same for the next three years. So it's there's not new and I can go okay. back and say, okay, this is what it was last year when they presented it, and this is what it is this year. Because I know we get new fun things and new different metrics to point out. We can add those, but I would love it if our report could just stay, stay consistent. consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, But included attendance by demographic. Yeah, yes. that would be great. Yeah. And any other things we decide we want to throw right. at you, you know, because you have unlimited time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank well, you for thank all you, you do. For thank us. you so thank much. You, thank you, Donna. Okay, that was a lot. We have a lot of information today. So we go on now to um, School Board Directors Recognition Month, and I've been told that our young Miss Fu is going to read that to us. Read that for us? No? No. <laughs> well, that's what I was told. We can't read it to ourselves. It's bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to read Thank you. Yeah. Whereas the mission of Washington's public school system is to ensure that all students achieve at high levels and possess the knowledge and skills to be responsible members of a democratic society and enjoy productive and satisfying lives. And whereas Washington's 295 locally elected school boards of directors and nine elected educational service district ESD boards are the core of the public education governance system in our state, serve more than 1.1 million students, have a combined annual budget of over $15 billion, and employ approximately 120 120,000 people, and whereas school boards play a crucial role in promoting student learning and achievement by creating a vision, establishing policies and budgets, and setting clear standards of accountability for all involved, and whereas school board directors are directly accountable to residents in their districts and regions, serving as a vital link between members of the community and their schools, and whereas school boards and e ESDs provide a passionate voice of advocacy for public schools and the welfare of school children. And whereas it is appropriate to recognize school board directors as outstanding public servants and champions for public education. Now, therefore, 
Jay Hensley, Governor of the State of Washington, do hereby proclaim January 2023 as School Board Recognition Month in Washington, and I encourage all people in our state to join me in this special, special observance. Thank you. Oh, Marty's on the move. <laughs> So this is, um, you know, in in education, we don't we don't say thank you enough, you know, to individuals working hard in public education. So, um, you know, annually, our boards recognize across the state of Washington for the very good work that they do. The job of a board member to the community and those online is a, nearly a thankless job. It's a really, really difficult job. And so it takes some very committed individuals to, you know, strive to make their community and their schools better. And um, we are so fortunate in the Port Angeles School District to have a tremendous board. In fact, um, I cannot imagine um, being the superintendent of a district, you know, ma navigating the last three years as we've been talking the last, you know, 45 minutes with regards to the struggles and the challenges that we faced. Um, you know, those outside this room would not have, you know, any context of the challenges that we were faced on a daily basis and this board was able to overcome. And so, you know, I stand here today to really, you know, Thank you for the, the job that you do. Um, I um, am very um, gracious and honored to have such a capable and dedicated board of five. And I, I say thank you. Now, we have some, uh, some great things. I know this is like I'm, what I say doesn't matter, but these do. <laughs> uh, you know, we have some uh, great you know, uh, posters and some different things from our schools. Um, this one's from uh, Jefferson Elementary School, which is great. Thank you for bringing that over. Anything you want to add to that? I do. So one of our parent educators took this project on. So within the wolf's head is every single student's name and every staff member's name uh, in there with oh. the thank you at the bottom. But more more cool, the toe of every single paw print uh, represents a thumbprint of every child in the district. Oh, oh, no way. That's very That's cool. That's so That's cool. adorable. Thank you, Rhonda. Very Thank cool. them. That's so we know sweet. The parent educator. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jennifer Frazier. I and she worked hard on, on doing all of this. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's now amazing. for these these um, special gifts. I mean, you have some special gifts at your tape at your desk, mm -hmm. but these others are going to be. Um, you're going to have to determine who gets to take what. <laughs> um, I have another nice um, thank you, and this, Jenny, this is from which school? I'm not sure. Okay, this one came in and um, was posted. I'm not sure what school oh, this is. Dry Creek? Maybe Dry Creek, and then you have Hamilton here, and you have Roosevelt here. You have some swag that Yao put together mm -hmm. for, uh, helped put together for, um, very cool from Port Angeles High hogs. School. I'm very fancy now. I and, can't lose it now. And, all so, the district. Oh, we get some magic cups. Oops. Uh oh, I'm off the so board the now. <laughs> so this, is, this is what uh, the district is yeah. giving to. This is what the district's giving to the board. A nice black mug. And we love Isn't it. Isn't that nice? Yes. <laughs> it is so nice. Hey, yeah. I look for a logo. Wait. So when you put your coffee in the morning. <laughs> I'm going to go hot water in this mug. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> it's like a magician. <laughs> I don't like the spot. It's going to happen. Fill it up. It's gonna happen. Fill it up. I, I thought it was pretty instant. But, uh, oh, there, there it comes. comes. Oh, look. What is that? There it comes. Oh. So when you drink your coffee in the morning, it starts just basic black Look mug. at that. And as you put Part your, your coffee in there, district. you will see you know, two sides to this. It has the Port Angeles School District. Oh, look how the cool. Other side. <gasps> You'll have, you know, we're at the school district director. So it'll remind you of the wonderful That's work that you do each and every day. And be that little Where's surprise mine? each and every morning. But in all honesty. I think this one's yours, and I think he's got Thanks, mine. Marty. Okay, that's got hot water in it. Okay. So <laughs> Don't burn. I can't trust you. I'm sorry. you and you shouldn't. That's very but, that's super you know, all jokes aside, you know, again, I can't say how appreciative I am for the leadership that you've shown over the last, you know, many of you for many more than three, but the last three have been really difficult. 
And together we've been able to, we have a lot of work to do and we're not gonna, we're not gonna downplay that, we're not gonna sugarcoat it. We have work to do and we have the people, we have the board, we have the administrative team, we have the instructional staff, we have the support staff to carry out the work. We will get there because that's what this district does. But it starts at the top. And so I appreciate your commitment to you know, this school system, our community, and to supporting all of the educators of the Port Angeles school system. Um, you are phenomenal, and for that, I thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So that brings up Ms. Kira Acker. Oh, I'm sorry. We're gonna we're gonna just take a a quick little break here. All right. Okay. Yeah. We'll be back at eight o'clock. Five minutes. Oh, geez. Be oh. careful. Be careful. Oh, I'm plugging mine here. Hot water now. Oh no, I think it's fine. I see you in the <laughs> I want to see how long it till it goes back to black. That is really cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. We should yes. take that to our um, you, like the what do you call that? You hold your I can't go. Really it won't let me go. <laughs> Who won't let me go? I can go. Yeah, I just have it. I just don't know. If she can't get a room, you can just stay with me. All right. You don't want to stay with me in a room. Why not? Because I don't know. I can't sleep with anybody anymore because okay, I can't well, sleep so with anybody anymore. So what you're saying is anymore. you don't want to stay with me. No, That's I'm fine. <laughs> She's going. Yeah. She's going. She's leaving. I don't know who that is. I can't see. That was Darlene. Darlene, that's who that is. No, these two. My poor lady. That's Darlene. She's the one. She's the reporter from the newspaper. Um, oh, I was totally wrong this whole time. I was like, wow, she's taking good. No. No. Uh, I wondered if Darlene had a had a bee in her bonnet. No. Oh, good. That's good. Turn your thing off. Good. It has to stay in this thing, in her bathroom, for like three to seven weeks. Oh, no. And she has to like wear gloves and poor little kitten. Oh, that's so sad. I know. Hopefully the other cat doesn't get it. She has two kitties? Yeah. Oh, I thought she said one kitty. That's good, yeah, I'll let you. Hey, you look really fancy. Looks good. You look good. Thank you. Those pants, I like those pants. That's a, that is a, I, I.
back. All right, we now welcome you, Miss Kara, to give us the good news. <laughs> the news. The news. All right, so we're going to look at December enrollment and November financials. So, um, first slide here this is our uh, headcount for December. You can see we are at 3477, um, which is up five from last month at 3472 in November. Let's continue to creep up a little bit. Next slide. FTE, we are um, up nine from last month. Uh, here at, you can see at 3385. And that is an average of 3388 for the year. Yeah, so it, you know, and then it just breaks it out. Our normal reports breaks it out by um, headcount and FTE per um, per grade. Just a couple things I wanted to point out. There weren't too, there weren't that many anomalies. Um, we pretty much went up every um, at every um, building at every site. The high school was down a little bit in both FTE and, and um, headcount. Um, our SPED numbers continue to rise. We're at 604 now. Um, yeah, up from 572 um, last year. Um, so we're at 17.3% of our um, population is now SPED. SPED 17.3%. Last year, um, last December, we were at 16.4, so it is continuing to rise. Do we know, Kira, do we know the, uh, what other school districts across the peninsula have for SPED percentages? I don't know that, but I can find that out. It just seems awfully high. But it's very high. Okay. Especially when you only get... Like Especially when you get funded at 13.7. Yeah. It is crazy high. Correct. So I will I will find those I will find those percentages out. Um, one of the other things you know I track Running Start. We've been tracking Running Start for years, really closely. Um, and what I what I did find this year is um, you know even though our enrollment's down, I, I looked I wanted to look at it by percentage. So I have we have um, our headcount is this this year is at ten percent, whereas last year it was at fifteen percent. So we have decreased 5% of the juniors and seniors that were enrolled and going full time to um, to, uh, or to, a, to a Running Start program. So it has dropped 5%. Um, and our FTE is actually dropped 6% of both the juniors and seniors that were full time equivalents. So um, so that is a that is a difference in um, in our headcount our our Running Start data from last year. And, and it's good. I'm glad they're staying in our in Do our we doors. know, uh, is there any way, this isn't probably a care question, be interesting to find out from those students who are now at the high school who were at Running Start, if the college and the high school being paid for now is making a difference in their choices. Instead of going to Running Start now, they can get those credits at, at the high school that they couldn't get before. I don't know if that makes Oh, be an interesting question. Yes. Oh, yeah. I have like some friends that have switched at the semester mark or at the end of quarter of running start to back to the high school, and all of them just like we've been doing online school for so long, and the running start is only like the three classes, and I guess like some of them I don't know I haven't really looked into the running start, but I guess some of them are like most of them are online, and they did not want the online classes oh. anymore, and also like I have friends who like. Uh, they wanted like the more prestigious, like they're looking at more prestigious schools. So like doing the seven periods a day rather than like three classes, right? Um, with like, cause if you take like the highest, you could still do like three or four college classes plus your three electives. So you still get like the same college credits, just like plus, I don't really know, but like talking to my friends of their day really could be in College of the High School classes on our campus and then the other half would be the the CTE elective classes so um, yeah so it, it is beneficial and they're getting an in-class experience right. and um, being able to get credits from UW and Eastern and um, where, do they do that? where do they do that do they all come together and do it when you say spend half the day at the high school and 
No, they're actually in our in the classrooms with our teachers in at the high school. For college in the high school? So that our students are actually enrolled at the college and our teachers are certified through the college and are teaching the college curriculum. So when they when they finish that class, then they have credits from the college. How many teachers are mm -hmm. certified in that way? We have quite a few. I'd, I'd have to look exactly how many, um, but it's you know history, math, science. Um, yeah, I can think of six right off the top of my head in, in both of those but I but I know there's more so I can bring that I can bring that data back too if you like. No, that's okay. No? I guess I thought the college and the high school was online. That's why I was confused when you said they didn't want to go online. Mm -hmm. Okay. So none of it's online. It's all in taught by a teacher that we pay. Correct. But they, it, yeah. And but they play at Peninsula College they're doing online coursework. Is and that they yeah I online I, edit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would make sense. So they're just, it's, a, it's the curriculum that's different. They're, te they're getting university curriculum. Yes. Correct. Yes. In lieu of regular, their regular English or history. Yes, so I, I do know that the history classes are taught and are actually the, that curriculum for the whole class. Um, I know that for math, um, I've talked to John Henry, and there are actually some students that, that choose not to take, they're taking his class, but they're choosing not to get the college credit. So the, the uh, students that are getting college credit are doing a little bit more. I think maybe they're doing additional testing or additional um, projects to receive their college credit. But I, but I believe in history, it's all the same curriculum. Um, and they, the whole, they can re they're all receiving the same curriculum. They can get the, the college credit or not. But there are some college credit. Um, eight classes. It's basically an entire semester and a half. Like if you went to the UW, you would go in almost as a sophomore. It's all through UW. UW, but no, it's Eastern Washington, University of Washington, but all University of Washington accepts we'll all, all those credits. That's good. So, yeah, That's you awesome. end up. It, it helps a lot. Uh, Maisie Tucker, you mm -hmm. might have heard of her. Um, she, she was able to register for her classes earlier than other freshmen and earlier than other sophomores because she where she landed in the terms of number of credits she had so that makes that can make a huge difference particularly at a big school like UW when getting into classes that are premium yeah I mean we're really giving these kids a, a big push in the right direction by letting them take those classes when my kids went through it I had to pay for the university credits now we pay for the them. district pays for them, and it's clearly paying off a little bit, according to Yao and you. Yes, I mean, and having yeah. those FTEs makes a big difference. Exactly. So if they're staying on campus and they're and we're keeping those FTEs, yeah, um, we are paying their tuition, but um, it's offsetting itself because the the running start is dropping. the The number that we have to pay the college for running start is is dropping. Could could you uh, report that in numbers of students rather than percentage? Because I don't, the percentage means nothing to me. I don't know how many students we're talking about. Um, sure, in fact, I, I mean, if it's 20 students or 200 students, I mean, I'm. Um, I know that we, it was, oh, I didn't. I, I, That's okay. I, Could, I switched it into percentages because I thought that would be easier, but I can bring the numbers back to you that we, the difference. I'll, I'll report that again next month. Okay. It says 40 total of running start only. Well, I'm not looking at your yet. slides. Is that right? Yeah, so 40 for December th yeah, this year, and then we just have to look back, and I think it was 58. I mean, it was a difference of whatever, oh, the, whatever the difference oh, I of see 5 percent of last running year. Store. Yeah, but our I don't have any numbers. Our total enrollment had had decreased for for juniors and seniors, so the percentage was a little bit different. So I'll bring those numbers for you, so you can see on it, or the actual number of students uh, in headcount and then in FTE. That would be good. Okay. Sure, of course. Any other questions about enrollment?
I'll find him. <clears throat> Tell us about our money. Here, Quill. <laughs> I can't stand you. Okay, so month end November 2022. We are 33% of the way through the school year. Um, here you can see with our other fund balances, um, 43,000, under 44,000 in debt services, <clears throat> our ASB, um, they're doing uh, a lot more of fundraising and activity in ASB. You can see our, our revenues are up quite a bit, 16%, um, quite a few more revenues. And then also our expenditures are higher at 54% over budget. Um, that's a big jump, almost $100,000 they're doing. So they had lots of activities, lots of lots more um, athletics, um, trips and fundraising and purchasing and just the stuff that you're supposed to do in high school. So it's so yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, tra transportation, uh, vehicle fund, we have one bus, two buses on order. Um, and we did just purchase some uh, surplus buses from Issaquah. Issaquah had a huge fleet that they were getting rid of and they had three buses that um, they were basic, I mean, good buses that they were basically giving away. So got them so yeah. they're, all, they're in route so that's good that's not reflected here but that just happened last week how much does a bus cost um anyway from 100,000 125,000 okay. um just, what, just depending they, rid of their buses? they have run out of room in their yard they don't need all the buses they have it's a hard it's a horrible problem, problem. problem. Yeah. Clock, so, yeah. um, how, how much do we pay for the bus um, for their bus we got them we got three for five thousand each yeah. So I'll take, nice. I'll take one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nicely done. Yeah. That was Karen. That was all Karen. Karen, all right. Yeah. Good. She needs a high five. She, yes, we'll high five her. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, here's a general fund and uh, capital. You can see you just continuing to increase our capital funds and um, collect our levy taxes here. This this year is 4.3 million um, for a total of 21, just under or just over 21 million. Um, general fund, our ending fund balance there at 2.5 million for November. Next slide. Um, program or 25% through budget um, for 33% through the school year. So you can see that we're um, you know trending under with expense for the for the year. Um, really nothing, there aren't any, any differences here with program. Um, we have, we have a few grants that have just kind of, that have just come on board and you'll see some more spending in, um, next month in December. So our, uh, SPED, IDEA, um, there aren't any expenses in that one, that 125,000 in budget. There aren't any expenses yet because we just, um, we just brought that online last month. Um, and. Yeah. Um, are there any questions about this slide? Nope. I was very hopeful that we were only going to spend thirty-two hundred dollars in travel when I, which I budgeted. Marty looked at me like, hmm, "Yeah, right. We're already way over for that." So I'm going to have to adjust that a bit. <laughs> so, um, all right. So for MSOX, um, for our materials, we um, this is the this is the one that's always off with um, because of our our spring. Um, this time last year, that 1.1 million um, did include our um, our uh, Running Start bill, and this year we just we received it, and we're going to have paid it this month in January. So that's the difference. Um, I am hopeful, other than the Running Start bill, that you're going to see it's MSOX um, under that 700,000 each month from now on. Next slide. And then this is our um, just our overall salary and benefit expenditures for. Uh, for the month, 4.6, I was looking, it is high. We are still um, paying some of the contractual obligations of the different things that we settled with the teachers, um, the additional days. Those are extra, um, those are paid extra on top of their contract. So that's what you're seeing in that 4.6. Um, and of course, it also includes the 5.5% increase that we gave um, teachers. So um, the average should go down each month to about 4.3 million moving forward. Next slide. And here's our fund balance, what we're looking at, um, what we're projecting. Oops, I didn't didn't make this line solid, but um, we are here through November. 
and then projecting that kind of lull all through until we make it to our our April um, tax um, tax payout, our levy payout in April. Um, so that will shoot back up and then continue to pay, make our payments as our apportionment um, apportionment payments drop um, in June, and then we'll we'll go back up once we um, once they're their apportionment payments jump back up to the nine ten percent to get us up to four five four six is what I'm hoping what I'm projecting for the end of the year. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kira. Thank you, Kira. Thank you. Okay. So now we're on to our action items. <clears throat> So, we are going to start at 8.01, approval of the second reading of policy 3230, student privacy and searches. Do I have a motion? I move. I'll second. Motion is second. Any discussion? I believe this is the one that I had some an edit on. Okay. Just double checking. No, yeah. Sorry. Please, sir. All right, no. So, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous. Okay. That takes us to 8.02 approval of the second reading of policy 5001 hiring of retired school employees. Do I have a motion? I move to approve 8.02. Second. And second. Uh, any discussion? No? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous. Okay. 8.03, approval of the first reading of policy 1610, conflicts of interest, districts with 2,000 or more students. I'll move to approve this motion. Dr. Marks seconds. Okay, so any discussion? Mm -hmm. No discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And unanimous. And that takes us to 8.04, approval of the first reading of policy 3117, students in or released from an institutional education facility. Dr. Marks moves for approval of policy 05. I'll second. Is there any discussion? I, w I want Marty to talk about this. All right. Marty, would you kind of give us some information about this? Releasing people from educational oh, sorry. facilities or, I mean, institutional. What, do we, is this an important part of our um, student body? Mm, it can you know, it, is it an important part? I yeah, mean, I mean, I think every student's important, but right, like. Right, but I mean, it maybe, is this a large part no. of the student body? No. Okay. I mean, how many students would this impact um, over the year? That's hard to say. I mean, I would have to do a little research, okay. Sandy, but you know, okay. it may be a handful of students at okay. most. I will say that this has been, I wish Patty Happy were here right now. This was her. Her baby. She was always so frustrated because so many juvenile services, the kids who were in juvenile services were not getting services. They weren't, so they'd come back to our public schools yeah. and they would already be six Definitely. weeks, eight weeks behind. And so she was always just begging us to get a policy that would focus on those kids and make sure that we are. So let's say the Clown mm -hmm. County Juvenile System will have kids in there who maybe yeah. aren't from Clown County at yeah. the time. A lot of juvenile depends on where you yeah. were arrested and how they're spaced. Anyway, so I'm glad that we're addressing this and because this will give those kiddos a bit of a more fighting chance okay. when they come out. Agreed. This gives us some guidance on <clears throat> helping transition students from, you know, the institution to, you know, public schools. Um, and gives them some uh, gives some assurances around some accommodations that we can make 
in order to make that transition a little more seamless for a student that's gone through some challenging times. And not so overwhelming, Yeah. right? They can get yeah. gather a lot of, I went to school in SWIM and then I was in Nia yeah. Bay and then I was in Grays Harbor. Now we can, we have a job to amalgamate all the stuff and make sure we're getting them the credit. So they're not faced with this, oh, you have to get 24 credits in the Port Angeles School District. It's, yeah. Okay. It's overwhelming. So this is, a, I'm very, uh, very happy with this. We do uh, help those children, though, when they're in detention here. We have not been historically not great that. about it. No, we are now. We've gotten when better. When I was working with the uh, courts, um, some issues about juvenile addiction issues that out there, I was under the impression when I would go out for Judy that there were educational opportunities offered to them there. That's been some years ago, maybe. Yeah. No, no, it, it has ago. gotten better through the years, but still this, I think, will, <clears throat> will enhance that. It focuses more on the, the leap from juvenile to... Coming back. Yeah, which I think is a piece that gets missed too okay. often. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, anybody else have any comments? Okay, I'll call a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous. Okay, <coughs> so now we're at 8.05. Approval of the first reading of policy 3114, part-time, home-based, or off-campus students. Do I have a motion? I move this 8.05. Uh, 8.05. I second. Moved and seconded. Any conversation around this? Any discussion? Anything you need to add to this? Nope. I have one question. When they, uh, when a SPED student exits out, you know, we keep them to 21, right? Mm -hmm. We legally keep them to 21. Um, if they exit out before then, can they come back? If, if they it, exit if out at 18. If they're 19 and they exit? So they, at 19, if they exit, they can't come back. That's it. Rachel? They get a, they get a high school Penn State graduate as a benefit upon them because they're 21 and they're no longer eligible. If they didn't, if they didn't yet have any type of uh, high school diploma and um, and they, their evaluation was within that two years, they could still come back. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? All right, I'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? To unanimous. Okay, so that gets us through that fun and takes us to community comments. No community comments tonight. <coughs> Board of Directors comments. We'll start down at the end. Young Miss Boo Boo. <laughs> um, at the school, we're the juniors are planning winter ball. It's going. We still haven't had a confirmed date. We're thinking February 11th, but it hasn't been confirmed by our administration yet, but we are hoping for that day. Um, uh, our sports, we just had our rival game against women basketball. Fortunately, the girls lost, but it was really close. They were ahead at one point. It was a good game. It was a great game. Yeah, and then the boys won. Um, music programs wise, we're really getting prepared to go to New York now, go to Carnegie. We have a lot of things coming up. We got solo ensemble beginning of February, and then we got like Western adjudication and New York and a concert in March. So that'll be exciting. Uh, in leadership, there's a lot of things going on right now. Um, a lot of groups, we have a job fair coming up that Cole Acker is working on. Um, and we have, I don't know, a bunch of projects. We have another campus cleanup coming up, I'm pretty sure. Like the one we, we just did one. It's like in leadership, we have a bunch of different focus groups. So it's a different groups working on different things. And Yeah, I just want to say public thank you to the leadership class and the Port Angeles High School students for the campus cleanups. 
it is such a blessing to go up and walk through the campus and have it look and present itself so well. So thank you for taking pride in your high school. And thank you for our water bottles. Yeah. Yes. They're adorable. Pass that along to your whole little group. OK. Director Wright. It's nice to be back in the boardroom with you guys. Hello. And uh, had a nice holiday, but uh, I was excited about the meeting we had last night, the PLC work that we were doing, mostly because I got to be in a room with all of you again, which was really nice. We had, it seemed like I missed a meeting and then there was a couple missed meetings. We hadn't all been in the same room together in a really long time. Yeah. So uh, last night was great just to be around you guys and talk, that, talk about that work and other things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Okay. So I've been busy. I had a full PLC day with the um, teachers and, and the principals. And then last night we had the board one. And so I feel like we're moving right along with that. And, I, and I, was, I was especially pleased that the board got to participate. I think that's really important to have all of us together and, and have that discussion. And then I had an elementary committee meeting yesterday as well. And um, it's always fun, but a little bit threatening to see new technology. But at that meeting yesterday, and I, I went into this briefly, there was a black board, not like a blackboard chalkboard, but a board like uh, the smart boards. And it's called Sonic Whiteboard. And some of the buildings chose to um, have those as part of a grant. And they're going to make available on the 27th, the end of the month, for some teachers to have training with that. And I just found it really supportive of teacher work. It could have, um, they could get multiple copies. They would be able to access Eureka, access Wit and Wisdom, and just by the touch on the screen. And so the advantage of that particular model was that if students um, are at different levels and we're trying to have instruction focused at their level, a teacher could do that very quickly, which without that kind of support, it takes a long time to look through to get appropriate materials. So I can't speak eloquently about it because I don't know enough <laughs> about it, but I just thought what a great opportunity. And the person that was presenting was is a teacher, and so he has, done a lot of work with science and math and things that as we were talking Jacob and I that it's it would be motivational for kids to be able to see and do some of these things that for me is threatening because I would have no idea where to start but I'm just glad that we have some people who were interested wanted to try this and that we can move forward so we stay current and with things that will excite kids in a different way you think that would be something that would be useful for the whole board to have a little presentation on well, it at a I meeting? Think, I think I would like to, and I thought that board members might like to, I but like I don't to know it. where we are with it. But Can I just, we add that to one of our agendas? Just a quick little tech um, demonstration of the capacities, or would you rather we do that as a separate? No, I'll check into that. Okay. Yeah. I think that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'd, yeah like I'd like to see it. Okay. okay. Director Marks. Uh, let's see, I have attended the Kingston boys basketball game and the Squim girls and boys basketball game. It was really fun. I meant to bring their handouts and, I, and rosters and I forgot. I apologize. Um, let's see, I have attended the, um, I'm passing these out, committee okay. meeting for the WASDA interscholastic activities. And uh, we did, no, they're a set. Oh, it's a set. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. It's Katie. Of course it's all organized. <laughs> Come on. Well, Jenny <laughs> helps. So that's a so set. That's a set. Um, the WASDA Interscholastic Activities Committee took a advisory vote that will go on to the board. And uh, on the separate piece of paper is the results of the advisory vote that will go forward to the board of the uh of was uh, of the WIAA which is the 
Interscholastic Activities Association, and um, the packet with the staple in it has the actual right, uh, the actual amendments. So um, I am both the school district representative on the um, WASDA Interscholastic Activities Committee, as well as the regional representative, and so. Um, the discussions, I think the discussion that I wanted to point out was probably, um, you can read these at another time, but um, uh, Amendment 3, which splits the 1B classification into 2, which is interesting, and you can see in the documentation how they're splitting that out. And then the one that was also really interesting that, um, I don't think we have this, but uh, the eighth grade transfer, which is amendment five, where um, if you transfer as a middle school student to a smaller school, um, you can't play on their uh, varsity. Um, I don't know, there was a little bit of like, um, there's something that's going on in the state where kids are transferring to these small schools as in middle school so they can play varsity mm -hmm. and then they transfer oh, back to big it. schools. So they're trying to prevent some of that with that particular yeah. amendment. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird, our school, when we were in eighth grade, we could play on the varsity team. Yes, oh. there are smaller schools that they do do this. And so, so these it kids- look better for high school. Yeah, these kids that are middle school that get varsity experience just have a little bit of an edge. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, anyway, the rest of them, one thing that I did learn was that um, uh, there used to be more games per season. I think they said 30, and in the 80s when we had uh, gas shortages and expensive gas, mm -hmm. they cut the games down to 18 so that the school districts weren't paying as much money to actually attend games. And, on the expense of gas and mm. so they the games the number of games keep creeping back up for each sport and it's done individually so um, the one of the amendments is about basketball tournaments and whether or not four games at a tournament counts as one so things like and that. What if that game what if that tournament is in July does that count against the team in November? No. Oh, I, I didn't get into that detail. Oh, Sorry, sir. That's just a question. I mean, that's, I don't need you to go hunt that answer down. Yeah. Yeah. If you yeah. Had that. Um, no, and I think that I have a tech committee and CTE committee um, meetings coming up. So that's all I have. All right. Dr. Long. Well, well, Happy New Year, everybody. I'm glad we're back together. I'm on. I'm on. Good. Um, the, I think, I don't know, there was so much going on before Christmas, and but my time has been spent, um, I guess, mostly with the uh, um, middle school faculty and PACAC group uh, to talk about Stevens Middle School. We are really working hard. I mean, it's every week um, on t Tuesday nights, and it's uh, Sarah and Marty and I are there, and Nolan, and a lot of people from the uh, from our administrative team. But there are a whole bunch of teachers, and they make it so much easier because they know exactly their school. They know every little alley. They know every little space and what they want and what they don't want and what they need. And uh, the needs are great. You know, the needs are really great. Stevens is going to be a really great new modern beautiful school for our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, but it's going to take time. And I think people are asking me now, people in the community, well, when are they going to start building? Well, you have to have the money first. Yeah. And that's, again, just the public not understanding the levy and the, and the difference between levy and a bond. But so we're creeping up to time to really put pen to paper to see what the new school is going to with the organizations, that's what we're working on now. And they give us all kinds of games to play about 
where, what departments should be together and where and who and where do you put the common room and where do you put this and so we've it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle um, Sarah and I were on a team together and I we needed more <laughs> input from teachers for our team because the, with the other teams were just I mean they are right there they had every library and bathroom and whatever you know and it's funny because it's all coming together and it's just amazing to me the way that this is happening this is all information gathering um, and the the uh, team that they send um, the designers and the architects are fascinating to me they uh, they have spent a lot of time in the school measuring every inch of the school and talking about what would be best so that's where I've spent a lot of time um, and I'm looking forward to 2023 good year I have a question about about that and and it's just because I had heard one of the architects talking when we were at WASDA but one of the things um, for our families who don't have a lot I was I had wondered if we would consider either showers available for students who may not be have that available in their home because they may not be living in a home um, washer and dryers for students to clean clothes are those some of the things we're on the right uh, track yeah, yeah. We, have, we haven't talked yeah. about that specifically we yeah. have talked about that in regard to do we want to invest in something like that for the high school that's been a conversation we we haven't had that conversation recently but that's been the conversation I've been on a lot that we need that um, yeah but yeah. I feel like middle school kids are really separated by not <clears throat> having you know some of those things yeah. we take for granted in a home and I just yeah and we've okay. talked about kitchens and cooking yes. and um, you know teaching people how to cook and how to meet some of their personal needs um, that may not be getting met at home yes and that's that's a, a really that's been a yeah it has been part of the discussion. It has been a really, I, I'll just piggyback on you because this is pretty much all I've done too is PACAC, but um, when they broke us in, a couple things. One, I really appreciate the architects, everybody who's behind it has really been dedicated to, they're not cookie cutter people. Mm -hmm. They really listen to what makes your district tick. What is What are the things? And they listen to that and then they're, they're thinking about how to incorporate things like um, our native culture and our maritime culture and our logging, yeah. all of the different things that make Port Angeles Port Angeles. So I really appreciate that they listen to all of that. And then when they broke us into these six groups, Sandy and I were not good. We, did, we got through like, we, tried hard we got through about an eighth <laughs> of what the other groups got through. But they, um, it was six different ideas of what the school should look like and then we all went around and somebody presented as to why they thought the commons belonged here and why um, the entrance to the school should be here not here it was wow and we I, I think everybody sort of the last group that presented we were mm -hmm. like wow we yeah, didn't think of that that's good we want that oh, so um, it was wonderful. just it was really interesting and really the teachers and the parents the people who work in the school who that's their life that's what they do those are the people we really need to be listening to and the kids you know but um yeah it's a it's a great group it's an exciting dynamic group of people so um and that's really pretty much what i've been doing and trying to figure out how to be board president again oh you can do it mm -hmm. you're doing it i'm doing it so that's mm -hmm. all great that's you yeah oh. it's, i i concur like the creativity <clears throat> i mean some things that you know hadn't thought of um you know like not that it's I mean, there's no decisions made there will be oh, no, no decisions made there will be official presentations to this board before we take any substantial action it's just brainstorming at this point in time and um, you know some things that I just simply hadn't considered like flipping the entrance of the building from the south end south side of the school to the north side of the school hmm I hadn't thought about that mm -hmm. You know, and that really kind of opens up, you know, because if you think about the middle school, it sits in a hole. Yeah. When you enter, when you drive up, it sits in a hole. But if you were to enter on the other side, it would then be more school-like, mm -hmm. right? It wouldn't be a hole. And then your back of your school would be, you know, where the parking lot is now. So not to say that that's a decision, but creative thoughts. Yeah. 
and so I really appreciate that. Um, we uh, had the um, opportunity to, um, as cabinet, we were at Port Angeles High School this week, we had a great time. Um, you know, started with DECA, and DECA treated everybody to coffee, mm -hmm. which was awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I, that's I personally had an opportunity then. I was in the band class for some time. I was, I was in robotics for some time. Um, spent some time in the Clown language class. So just a great exposure of, uh, you know, the great diversity of classes that we have at Port Angeles High School. Um, and uh, that was exciting. Um, we're in the middle of, uh, um, you know, preparing our district for necessary, you know, budget reductions. So those conversations have started and, um, you know, working with the um, appropriate associations to make sure that there's clear understanding of the process um, and continuing to assess, you know, the, the need and the, do, you know, the needs for cuts. Um, you know, and how much to cut. So um, that ball is rolling. Um, again, the plan is to have a, um, you know, a plan that, um, you know, gives, has some detail by the end of February that you know, we'll share with you in a confidential manner um, sometime in March to then, you know, take official resolution in a very generic form to reduce um, staff and reduce force and program, and then start to execute the plan after board uh, resolution in April. Um, our goal is to be well out ahead of the May 15th requirement for um, reduction in force um, for two things. Number one, it's the right thing to do for our staff, you know, to notify them as quickly as uh, we know. One factor that does slow us down a little bit is what happens in the legislature. And I believe the legislative session, don't quote me on this, but it's some, I think it's April 23rd, but it's sometime in mid-April. So we really won't know what the, what the results of the legislative session is um, until that time. And so it will be, you know, the spring, the winter and spring here is gonna go very fast in our school district. May 15th will be on us before we know it. So um, a lot of work to do, but we have the right team to do it, and uh, we will um, you know, keep you uh, posted on the work, and the, uh, we, you ultimately have the authority to take final action on the proposals. So, um, and uh, it was great to see, like, or, you know, went, went out to the SQUIM basketball games, SQUIM PA basketball games on uh, Tuesday night. It was a lot of fun. Our kids did well. Um, it's always really great to see Port Angeles School District kids and, and student athletes conduct themselves so well, play so hard, and just represent this community the way we desire them to represent us. So, and SQUIM did as well. Hats off to both both sides. I think that's about all I have for this evening. Okay, but you're not done yet. Yeah. So <clears throat> before you today is um, a draft. This is in draft form, and um, I do want you to, um, you know, maybe not this evening, but based on our conversations in October. Um, you know, we had some legislative priorities, and we've tried to summar summarize that in a um, concise manner to align to our thoughts. Really, it falls in in a few buckets. One is a larger bucket, but it's really address regionalization, salary enhancements, and fully fund employee benefits. Fully funding employee, employee benefits has been on our legislative priorities for a couple of years. Um, Salary enhancements come in the form of if the state wants to allocate an IPD to, you know, provide, you know, it's not called COLA, but to provide, you know, um, a COLA type in increase to, to um, our staff. Um, we really need to develop a system at the state level that if it's a five and a five, five and a half percent IPD, that comes in the form of a five and a half percent increase to the to the school district. We know that that's not the case. This year it came in far less than half, you know, about 2.19% of a 5.5% increase. 
So there needs to be, and I hope there is some discussion and dialogue at the state level around how that can be fixed. They fund it based on the prototypical model. The prototypical model we know is an outdated model. That model was released in 2010, 2011, and doesn't represent schools in the in the in 2023. So um, you know, to fund it based on a model that hasn't really had any major um, adjustments in the last decade is a broken model. This year, I'm going to be quite frank. Um, I'm going to be aggressive with my word choices around the legislative session um, because you know we. You know, there are things we can control and there's so much we don't control. And um, I, and I know we as a board and superintendent are willing to step up and, you know, take the, you know, take the, the you know, the, you know, critics and the criticism around like choices that we make, like, you know, the last three years we have maintained our staff, you know, you know, using ESSER funds, even though we reduced our student population by upwards of 250 students, we maintained that commitment in our schools to provide the support and the resources that our students need and our staff need, quite frankly, using the ESSER funds, which is the full, that was the intent of the ESSER funds, okay? And so, you know, now has come time when ESSER funds are nearly expended and, you know, we're going to have to make some, some reductions. I'll own that. And I know this board will own that. But what I won't own is, you know, this broken model around IPD regionalization and, and, um, and benefits. We have no control over that. And it comes at a significant, um, you know, increase to our expenses in the, dis in the school district. Um, bullet two is fully funding special education. Again, I'm not going to own that. I'm going to be very vocal and critical of what needs to happen. Um, this state needs to fund the need. If a student qualifies for special mm -hmm. education, you know, our constitution said that's a paramount duty of the state. It needs to be funded. So this business of 13.7%, and that's the cap, and you figure it out after that, after we hear today that we're above 17%, that can't work. If this state believes in equity, it's time to step up. Because our most vulnerable population is not fully funded. Um, I believe, and nobody's talking about this, but we believe as a board and superintendent that we need to re revisit the, mo the methodology around property tax structures. There is that concept of property rich and property poor districts in our state. And that translates to your EP&O and the amount that you can collect from your local tax base without overtaxing them. Because people have extra buses. Yeah. <laughs> so can you, you, imagine? Just, you, just, you can just tell yeah. how that works and their property values are sky high. Yeah. I think it's a lot of fun. So, you know, and we've talked about <clears throat> the inequities around that. And, you know, I, you know, there used to be in the old funding model, there used to be, um, you know, levy equalization dollars mm -hmm. to address that. So that if you were a property rich district, you didn't get levy equalization. But if you're property poor, you get some money to make up the difference on what you can't collect from your EP&O. Or you shouldn't collect. Yeah, and that's like, right. And then you know, we gonna, get into that when we're trying to defend our bonds and asking our voters. And they say, why am I the only one getting hit? Because I own a home. I'm the one who's going to get hit, but yeah. you're not going to hit the other folks. That's an argument I hear all the time. And it can be relatively easily, you know, not easily, but you can mitigate it somewhat. But it's it's not a fair system. Yeah. Our taxation in this state is not fair across yeah. the board. Yeah, and I don't think there's any desire, but it, it, we need to continue to talk yeah. about it because you know desire. all of these no all of these issues that are on our list. Look are how long inequities. it took us to get rid of the supermajority for this levy. I mean, and it took years. Then, you know, the last item is you know we continue to advocate for um, well two items. I'm sorry. Uh, support simple majority in school capital bonds. Um, you know, capital comes tough out on the Olympic Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, and I've stated, stated this before, you know, and I, I've, I've testified at the state level. And I've heard lawmakers tell me and students that we took a few years ago that basically our opinion 
or our statements don't matter because if you worked hard to develop a rapport and relationship with your community, they would support bonds and levies. I'm going to say right now, today, that that is not true. And why that's not true is <coughs> I've worked in nearly every corner of this state. And you know, bonds and levies pass based on the economy of the region. And this, you know, our economy is, you know, it was slow to recover after the last recession in 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. And, you know, folks, you know, they vote that way. You know, whereas, you know, there's more, um, you know, revenue in other forms, other parts of the state. And so you can draw a direct correlation between like, you know, the local economy and passing bonds and levies. So I don't want to hear anymore that, you know, it's, it's the district problem. You just need to correct the problem locally because it is driven by the economy of the, of the, the local region. And then finally, um, permanent return of the state timber tax um, at the state and federal level. There's some discussion about that, some new discussion around that concept that may be beneficial to us in the world of capital. So what I would really ask that you do, and I'll take any, any feedback tonight if you have it, but you know, if you could spend some time on this and really dive into it and provide some feedback, because it is in draft form, legislation chat session has kicked off. And so I really want to be able to get this as our talking points when we get in front of our legislators, um, you know, to really advocate for ourselves in Port Angeles. So I'll entertain any questions you might have. Are they going to give us our 15 minutes? We get our 15 minutes, we drive down there, we spend the night, and then we get their 15 minutes. I just want to know they're going to be there. Do we know they're going to be there? I can't answer that. I either. know. I'm just. Should we have our super PAC give these talking points to our lobbying organization <laughs> that we hire? Oh, you're not in Issaquah, my dear. Isn't that how no. we get things done? <laughs> and nothing against Issaquah, but yeah. I mean, I would. What I would love to see is this be an insert in our um, mailer, yes. so that folks could fold it up in a little paper airplane and send it to or, to Olympia. I mean, if we could get all of our all of our constituents to also this this is a no-brainer they don't have to think about it they don't have to work at it it's already done just send it along hello mr. Theringer could you read this mm -hmm. so the community newsletter like you know it's a great community newsletter thank you Carmen it looks looks great but you know and we try to stay very positive in our community newsletter but um, my message is of this magnitude Good. and so you know our constituents are going to hear that, you know, one, we're facing, you know, budget cuts like maybe we've never experienced before. Um, and, you know, it's a state systems problem, and there are some things that need to be addressed. And so my hope is, Director Methner, that, or President Methner, that, you know, folks will read that and feel the need to reach out to their legislature. And, you know, as, a, as Kira and I went around and presented to each of the schools and departments in our district pre-holiday uh, break, you know, we encouraged folks to do that. And I also encourage folks to use our legislative priorities to speak to. So the sooner we can get this, the sooner I can get it to staff so that they can start to engage with the legislators to advocate for ourselves. Needs to be on our. I, I know that. <clears throat> I know that we often worry about being political. I get that, but there's nothing, in my opinion, we all can disagree. There's nothing political about advocating for our students, for our constituents, for our taxpayers, and our teachers. There's nothing political about that. That's our job. That's what we do. And so this, I'd love this to be on our brand new website when it comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one fifth system. Yeah. You know, we're going to approach this. Should have a print button with it, too. Well, I a print button and the addresses of every legislature. Every one of them. I would their love own that. Phone, which they don't answer. <laughs> so I would, you know, I don't think there needs to be a formal adoption of this. But each of you, if you would, even if you say, hey, they look good, just let me know. <laughs> or if you have some suggested edits, I can make those edits. We I can have make read those over edits. them already, and they are good, but I'd love it to all be on one page, yeah, it will which be. I'm sure you'll figure that part out. 
Um, but, you know, just over the next day or so, a few days, get it back to me with, you know, your comments and we'll make some adjustments, share it with the whole group, and then we can, you know, put, put it into action. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, that leads us to the end of our meeting, with the exception of uh, our meeting location and time for next meeting. What's, oh, oh, oh. So um, our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, February 9th, Lincoln Center Room 208 right here. At that meeting, we will have the Jefferson Elementary School Report, Students of the Month, Athletics and Activities Report, Asset um, Preservation Program Report, which is APP, um, Custodial Maintenance and Facilities Report, Teaching and Learning Progress Monitoring Report, um, National School Counselors Week will be recognized at that meeting, which is February 6th through the 10th and African American History Month, which is February 1st through the 28th of 2023. All right. So with that, we are going to recess into executive session. The purpose of our executive session is to review the performance of a public employee. Uh, no business will be, uh, no, no, no decisions will be, will be made, no actions will be taken. And we expect our uh, executive session to last 30 minutes. 30 minutes.